Okay, so it's uh, one o'clock. So if we kick off. So I we have, uh, I think, a full complement of uh, participants, 145, nearly nearly all. Um, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to this, the first webinar organised by the Federation of Astronomical Societies. Uh, this is about the uh, how to get back to doing outreach and a lot of discussion about how to do it safely and all sorts of ideas uh, discussed, including cling film over eyepieces and all sorts of things. And it dominated the discussion so much at the AGM that I thought it would be uh, a valuable exercise to have a meeting where we discussed, first of all, how we do outreach until we get to the point where it's safe to doing in-person outreach to discuss some of the issues of the, um, the, the safety, the backgrounds of the virus, the mitigations that can be taken, and then a practical uh, talk from uh, each of the, the four corners of the cake, if you like, sliced uh, indoors, out, outdoors one way, and sliced the other way as uh, those who have control over the organization of the outreach. Um, as in if you're organizing your own event, for example, or where you may not have total control yourself because you're doing it for someone else at a school or um, some, some other um, venue. So this is where we arrive at today. Um, I'm glad to say that we have uh, eight uh, very good speakers uh, set up for you. And um, we can start, first of all, with uh, James Hannan and uh, Ian and Claire Lares. Um, who are, uh, James is a science teacher, and Ian and Claire are in IT, and they're going to talk about uh, how to set up uh, Zoom for use. Obviously, most of you know something about Zoom because you're here, but they'll go into some of the other details. So if I get this right, um, I'm going to, I think if everyone else disables their video, then, um, then I think we, we, can, we can start. And you should be able to uh, share uh, share screen. All right. Uh, good. Good. Yes, I think we I think we're good to go. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, James, uh, and uh, I'll be starting off our um, our discussion this morning. We Ian and Claire will be joining in later on as we try and present this together. A lot of the things we do in North Essex Astronomical Society are sort of done collaboratively anyway. Um, so I'm the chair, Claire is the secretary, and uh, Ian is uh, one of our most active members who gets involved in everything. So we're, we're very lucky to have him. Uh, we cover a, quite a large area um, of Essex, sort of North and Mid Essex, so Chelmsford, Colchester, Braintree and surrounding areas. And we've had great success in growing our society over the last year. Um, we've now got over 200 members uh, and, and a couple of years ago we were around the 100 mark. Uh, of that we have about 20%, about 40 members are probably quite active and the main focus for us is our visual observing uh, and over the last few years we've had members get quite proficient in imaging and, and that's sort of leading us down other, other avenues now and we're sort of looking at how we can get involved in sort of, you know, sort of, um, in sort of community sort of science community projects where we can start doing um uh, you know contributing uh, to the scientific research where the various observatories around the country do stuff and we're very lucky that we have a fantastic observatory in a very sort of rural site um and we had uh, about 10 years ago funding to expand it so we've got a nice sort of uh, common area there with a, a seating area of facilities and uh, kitchen area and so on and obviously a big part of our society has been outreach. Um, the outreach is how we've grown our society and our numbers. It's how we encourage the next generation of astronomers in our area and uh, became a really sort of key thing for us over the last decade or so. And so to sort of really start off today's talk, it's really important that we start looking at what we did pre-lockdown. So we'll do a bit of a Chris Whitty here. Next slide there, thank you. <laughs> um, our pre-lockdown pre activities uh, involved weekly observatory meetings uh, for our members. Now, the observatory has access 24 hours a day, seven, uh, three, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. 
Um, but we really had one night a week where we had our members uh, meet up, which is on a Thursday. Uh, typically, that only got around a dozen or so people each week. Uh, the, most members would come down at some point, but we had a core sort of dozen or so that would always be there. Um, once a month, and I know many of the societies here do this more often or some do less often, but once a month we had a, an external talk um, for the public and for our members. And because of our location in Essex, we're really lucky. We had um, universities in, Lo in London on tap. We've got Cambridge not too far away. Hertfordshire is not that far away either. So we're able to tap into some excellent speakers to, to talk to our members and the wider society, uh, wider, wider community as well. We did two quite large public stargazing events every month. We had one at Aberton Reservoir, which is run by Essex Wildlife Trust, and we had one at Notley Discovery Centre, which is uh, run by Braintree Dis uh, Dis uh, District Council. So two large areas, and we, over the month, we would get anywhere between 100 to 200 visitors to our events. Um, and they were quite popular, especially when things would be on the TV, we could see an explosion of numbers at those uh, stargazing events. And so we got quite well known in the area. Uh, as, as something that, that um, parents could do with their children on a, on a Saturday evening, a cold Saturday evening when there's nothing else to do. Um, and this led us to sort of developing a young astronomers club, uh, young astronomers club. That was uh, a sort of a brainchild about a year ago. It's been uh, led by another one of our committee, Cheryl. She's sort of really grown out over the, well, pre-COVID had grown out to quite a substantial um, uh, form of outreach we had kids for uh, we had two primary school clubs running each month and we also had a central uh young astronomers club running out of um the uh, cressing templars bar uh, barn just down the road in cressing so we were very lucky we had also all these sort of outreach activities going on um but one of the main things we did as well was as i know a lot of the societies that are with us today do um is they went and talked to we go and talk and do observing sessions for schools youth groups clubs scouts girl guides and so on and that again was another sort of really big part of what we do and we were doing one or two of those every week during our sort of peak season so to suddenly have um that massive gap in our calendar whilst whilst it was a nice break <laughs> um it did start to make us worry because actually you know as a society we exist by having a uh having our membership we exist for the membership and without you know offering anything more than just a, a monthly newsletter or a weekly email um rightly people start to question why 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 am i spending this money during this potentially very difficult financial time so yes we had a bit of a post lockdown panic as we uh, once we you know all our personal lives and so on out of the way we you know we started thinking about what we need to do for the society we knew um that all our face-to-face -face activities had to cancel we knew we had to close down the observatory so our first priority had to be that we needed to make sure that we focus on our existing membership and we kept our society alive that was you know that was vital for us we had 200 members paying subscriptions and to be honest the big draw of the subscription was having access to the observatory we knew that was one of the main reasons people joined up even even though many maybe not accessed it throughout the year we knew it was a big draw and so not having that available was a big issue. We were also compounded that our observatory was flooded out for about three months, four months before COVID as well. So we've had quite an extended period of not being able to use it. Uh, by flooded out, I mean the field it was in was, was, was flooded, not the actual observatory. And essentially what it came down to was without members, there was no society. Um, and even with only a few members, it would make running the events that we, we like to run and doing the things we like to do very difficult so it was it was important that we, we kept that going um so our pr next priority after that was looking at um how we could keep the public engaged that's where we get most of our members is from engaging with the public and you know i think we've all been there there's always been an element where you talk to someone who comes along to one of your events and they say oh, i've been interested in astronomy for years but i've never sort of really got into it that's how we get people in. You know, we say, oh, well, we all started there. I mean, we, our membership varies from people that are highly experienced to people that are just starting out. And, and we want to encourage all those people to join. And so without that face-to-face -face ability to be able to talk to people like that, it was, it was very, it very soon became apparent that it was vital to try and offer those experiences as much as we could in a virtual setting. Um, and, uh, 
and one of the big things as well is you know we are members of our community um you know in north essex we you know we care about our community and during the time of lockdown people found it tough that people were very isolated and we had some members that lived by themselves members that um had nobody else around in the society and and maybe the come down to the observatory once a week or come to the talks once a month was one of their main social activities and we were sort of very socially aware that without that available we you know we we, we owed them a service to try and keep them communicating with and, and keep them part of the community so we felt a very a real sense of uh, responsibility in that sense as well that we wanted to do the best by all of our members and so that sort of led us um on to uh what i will do now is i will pass over to claire who's going to talk about the uh the challenges that we had thanks claire okay so when we look back through what happened through 2020 I don't want people to think that everything was super organised from day one and was really planned methodically. Quite a lot of the time it was like, well, try this. We tried things based on who was willing to get involved, who we could slightly persuade to get involved, and then took forward those things that worked best. But what we actually achieved wasn't by complete accident. Because of our focus on outreach, we already had a lot in the bank already and a lot of things set up. So our first problem was keeping in touch with our membership. And this is where the last few years has really paid off. Every week without fail, an email goes out to our members. Even if it says pretty much the same as the week beforehand, we know people don't read everything every week. And so being there and being regular, people expect it, they know where to look for it. And it's that constant drip, drip, drip. We also have our monthly publication pulse that goes on. Again, that keeps people in touch with us. It's got proper articles rather than short bits I put out. And we encourage people to contribute so they feel involved in society. And we also have our members only Facebook group, which is really active, but we are careful that it's not our prime method to communicate with people because only maybe a third of our members actually use it. For our public engagement, Facebook for us really works. We've got over two and a half thousand followers. And for that, we post interesting articles, images, um, videos that we've come across, and also tell them when we are doing outreach that it's going on. And it works really well for us. We use Twitter to a lesser extent. And history teaches us that for us, it doesn't work as much. That's not where our members come from. And um, we also have a mailing list of non-members, which we use occasionally to contact people. And I think going forward, we will be using that more often. But the big thing for us was about three years ago, we changed how members can join. We used to have the piece of paper, write a check, send it off method, which was a huge barrier. Now we use um, an online system, Member Mojo, people can sign up so quickly. I've been at outreach sessions while talking to people and they've grabbed their phones and signed up. It also means that people are more likely to renew because again, Rob has to check out, especially when they aren't seeing people, they just click the button and they're back with us. We've tried other methods. We don't talk about the great WhatsApp discussion of 2018. <laughs> And also we use Facebook Messenger, but only for that to organize volunteers. It's very short messages, it works. It's not great for long discussions. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, so the key thing I'd say is make sure your communication is structured, work out who you're going to be talking to and what you want them to gain and what you want to do next. For us, everything comes through the secretary it means we have we speak as one voice we speak with a professional tone um not that we talk as you no know, robots it comes as personal but professional at the same time and it is it's regular and it's frequent um every monday people get something from me social media is hit at least four times a week if there's lots going on in the world then i'll be posting more things than that but it's just regular, regular, regular. 
Okay. Um, okay, so while yeah, the subject of this is outreach, I think we make no apologies for the fact that a lot of what we've done is for our members for the reasons James has explained. Um, we have got a core of perhaps um, 40 members who are quite active, but the other 160 are important to us. Um, it's important to keep them engaged. And I think the methods we use for public outreach and methods we use for members are equally applicable and, uh, and you know, can be used in either scenario. I think it's sometimes tempting to think that people aren't that involved in the society, that's on them, but very much our mission is to be friendly and open. And we know a lot of people are busy and they're not necessarily got the time to get involved, but are still interested in, and we want to try and make sure they get something out of us. So our second big problem really after communication was um, trying to figure out how to replace those face-to-face -face activities that we've previously been a lot of the glue that was holding our society and the wider public together with us. Um, now with hindsight, it might seem obvious that some kind of video chat solution would be the way forward. But I can promise you that if you'd said Zoom back at the start of March, 90% of people would have given you a bit of a funny look. But fortunately for me, uh, I, I'm reasonably tech savvy, you know, 25 years working in IT, um, a strong background in it so I was quite comfortable with, the, with with technology and Claire is as well she kind of sets me right on a lot of things so having run lots of corporate IT departments video conferencing wasn't an alien concept and I've used pretty much every system available most of them being complicated and very unreliable uh, fortunately I've come across Zoom in 2019 it had been around for quite a few years prior to that but really 2019 it was taking off in the corporate world it was one of the few video conferencing solutions that actually worked pretty reliably. You weren't spending the first 15 minutes of every meeting trying to get it to work. People could just get it up and running. The big advantage for non-corporate people, such as astronomical societies and the wider public, of course, is it's free to get started with. It's simple to set up. There isn't much software to install. You don't even have to register for, register for an account to attend the sort of meetings, find somebody else who's hosting them. And it is very reliable and it's got good functions and it works across most devices and operating systems without any real technical headaches. So we held our first uh, virtual club night on the 2nd of April, 2020. And by the end of April, Zoom's global usage had jumped 30 fold from the start of that month. So I think it's fair to say we were in at the ground floor there uh, and it proved to be in a good mood. Virtual club nights were very popular. A lot of people turned up, obviously they weren't able to go out and about in April. Um, and whilst Zoom offers you uh, 40, you know, 40 minutes free, it does give you a couple of meetings at the start to try and really run with unlimited time, which we overran through the notional 40 minute meet, uh, limit every time. So we decided to purchase a subscription straight away. And um, when we came to ja J July, we uh, decided we could save some money. We knew this wasn't going to go away quickly. So we just went to an annual plan. And um, whilst we didn't have a big form discussion about Zoom, I, I can say, you know, those of us who had experience with other systems were able to rule them out for lots of good reasons. Skype is okay, but it's pretty unreliable in terms of call, call quality. Lots of glitches and problems. Um, I spent two years working in Bristol prior to this, and uh, my wife's in Essex, so you know we had lots of experience how, how unreliable Skype was. Um, and it's really only suitable for small group meetings. Microsoft are moving on to Teams, which lots of people have used now. It's sort of the replacement for Skype. Uh, but it's more painful to register for. There's a lot of hassle with it. It's quite corporate. Like I think if you I talk to anybody who works in a business who has to use Teams, they'll say they wish they could use Zoom instead. Um, and some of the other options that are now around, like Google Meet, that's not that popular, and Facebook Rooms was really a knee-jerk uh, reaction to Zoom. To be honest, it wasn't wasn't around at the beginning particularly. And all of them require people to register for accounts, so privacy concerns, etc. So. Zoom, I think, if you're looking for a solution, is the way to go. Um, I was clear. Okay, so our weekly, our events we use in Zoom were our weekly club nights. These were very much on the social side. It was a bit of a chat. Um, some people turned up maybe in half an hour. Some people were all trying to kick off close to midnight. We'd be talking about astronomy. Um, if new members join, we Real, make a real effort to actually engage them. Some people are a bit shy when they first come in. So we do try and draw them out gently. There's a lot of random discussions we bless you, from cake, make, cake making, good TV shows, which is really important. Um, counting snails in your garden by taking numbers on them. 
like we've got one of our member in Switzerland. We don't chair these meetings, but we just try to facilitate and make sure no one gets left out, no one talks over anyone. If there's a bit of background noise, because people have their own discussions in their own households, then we'll mute them for a bit, but we tell them it's going to happen. We have a few standards of behaviour, but everyone behaves themselves really well. We had a short period when we could actually have a few people in our observatory. So we had a mixed night where we had some people by Zoom, some people by the Zoom from the observatory. Um, Cheryl was our hostess for most of this <coughs> and would take her iPad around to show people the observatory that hadn't been there before. Then what else did we use it for? Oh, we used it for um, committee meetings. Again, so we could actually function as an organisation and make decisions we needed to make. We had our quiz nights. I see some of the dreaded quiz nights. We haven't done a lot of those because there are a lot of those going on. The ones we did actually worked really well because people who hadn't seen for ages would come along from a quiz. If you are going to do a quiz, I recommend using VBOX. It's free. It will do all the marking for you so you can save, save a lot of time and energy. And then we had our Imaging Wednesday night. Um, actually, I think I'll let you talk about Imaging Wednesdays because you sort of do that one. Okay, well, uh, it, we had a bit of a request from some of the members who were interested in imaging to do something. And uh, I said, well, I'm doing enough already, so I'm not going to run this one for you. It's not going to be a uh, tutorial type thing. We just started a little sort of group. And I very much said, it's help, help, guys. You know, you come along, you help each other. And it's worked really well. We've had a number of new members have joined who came along to Imaging Wednesdays, who are now a couple of thousand quid lighter in their wallets <laughs> and uh, are actually really good images. Um, and we've also had lots of people who haven't spent a lot of money, but have, have you know, uh, got some good results. So I think it doesn't have to be, you know, I think the lesson we took from that is it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be really planned. It doesn't have to be really organized. You can just bring people together and let them get on with it. Um, I think the last thing we're doing now is we're starting to work on an introduction to astronomy um, session, which we're hoping to start this month uh, it, on a similar sort of self-help, slightly guided process for people who want to learn about astronomy, really rather than being over-planned, just being a, a process of sort of questions and answers and short presentations rather than sort of a formal course. Um, so moving on to public outreach, I think the challenge we had there was similar. Um, we thought about looking at Zoom webinar, which is what we're using today, which is great for much bigger events, but we decided it was a bit too expensive for us. We wouldn't use it enough to justify the cost. So we have typically just used our ordinary Zoom Pro subscription to run our public events. Um, the only real challenge there is that uh, you have to make sure the members are aware that they could be visible uh, if they don't turn their video and sound off, if there's a talk or something going on. And we just warn people about that in the email and at the start of the session before uh, before we start streaming it. The big advantage of Zoom over uh, some of the other systems is you can link it directly to YouTube. Um, and Facebook. And Facebook, so well, with one or the other, you can't do both at the same time. So we decided we'd use YouTube as our sort of public platform. We had a YouTube channel already, and I know there's a talk about that coming up, so we won't go on about that too much. It's a little bit complicated to get Zoom and um, uh, YouTube working together, it's, you have to jump through some hoops. That's coming from me. I'm, I'm an IT guy. I know what I'm doing. So I would say practice makes perfect. Definitely give it a, a give it a try and lots of practice sessions before you go public. But essentially, what you can do is you can just um, start your uh, Zoom uh, meeting, do your share screen like we're doing, share the PowerPoint, and then once if you set it up right, you can just click a button and you can start streaming that meeting directly into YouTube and people can watch it live on a YouTube screen. Plus it can also then be recorded on YouTube and played back. Uh, you can see an example of one we did recently on, on solar. The only thing I don't particularly like is you get this big Zoom logo in the corner, but it's a small price to pay. Um, it is a little bit convoluted. And if anybody wants any help, maybe just um, to, just uh, do a bit of Googling or if you're stuck, maybe contact the FAS and sure they can put, put us in touch with you. We can tell you what you need to do. Um, so we ran several talks. I think one of the other thing we learned was really if you've got an external speaker or, some, or somebody who's not that tech savvy, have a practice. Uh, don't take no for an answer because it will go wrong. We've seen some <laughs> other talks from other people where it has gone wrong. Um, and always have a plan B just in case something goes wrong. Uh, we did have to cancel one meeting 
due to an internet outage at our house actually but generally if you've got a recorded video or somebody else willing to step in you can keep going um, we've also done quite a lot of live observing and this is something again we were doing prior to lockdown uh, again this could be done really simply through zoom you could just start your zoom meeting on a pc that's connected to your telescope and your camera um, that works um, quite well. You just do the share screen thing again. Um, alternatively, you can do it a bit more professionally and we use a, a product called Open Broadcast Studio, uh, which was developed really for gamers. There's a big sort of world out there. There's things, things like at YouTube and a service called Twitch where people literally are making hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, playing video games for money, believe it or not. Um, but the tools are free and they're really useful. I mean, Open Broadcast Studio is a basic TV studio on your desktop that allows you to capture stuff from your webcam, it allows you to capture stuff from other windows on your PC, PowerPoint, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can then stream that directly to YouTube um, and just do your own lots of TV kind of cutting from scene to scene. Or you can actually use the output from Open Broadcast Studio as a feed, as a webcam directly into Zoom. So effectively, you could just have a Zoom background. Um, so this is my setup, which is kind of not an overnight thing. It's a product of about two years practice, but uh, you know, I've got a big screen with a webcam and I've got a PC out in my observatory that I manage by remote control. Um, we then use Zoom and I've also got some screens where I can preview what I'm showing people. Uh, and I've got a separate Android tablet that controls um, the Open Broadcast Studio software so I can do things like turning the green screen on and off and changing from one scene to the next. Uh, this was actually National Astronomy Week that I know Lucinda uh, facilitated really, really well. Uh, and we did some great observing and, and live stuff like that. I would say start simple and build up. Don't try and do everything in one go. It is quite complicated. You basically, you've got to be a TV presenter speaking coherently, which I can just about do. Uh, you've got to be an astronomer driving your telescope and doing your imaging. You've also got to be a broadcast technician and uh, a managed stream at the same time, as well as your own IT person. So there's a lot to do, um, start simple and build up. Uh, so we've done some great streams. Uh, we've still on a YouTube channel. I said, I think the highlight for us this year was helping out with National Astronomy Week where we did some really good observing. So we um, had a budget for this year. Uh, I'm not gonna read every line of it because you know, you're growing up, so you can read those numbers, but you can see it's not hugely expensive. Our biggest new expense this year has been paying for on Zoom. And given what we've learned from it, even when we can meet face to face, our imaging group still wants to meet. So I'm telling Jamie now, we're carrying on with that expense, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I say without all of this, we really wouldn't have a society to speak with in 2020. I keep an eye on who's renewing and who's not. For a period of about eight weeks, I was able to say in our newsletter, welcome new member. So in the middle of lockdown, people were joining us even though I was saying to them, you know, have no meetings, it's only by Zoom, people still joined us. And the number of members we lost in this period was the same as we do normally. There's always a little bit of turnover. So actually, I think everything we put together has worked really well and kept our society going and also kept people in the society happy, engaged, and give something to do when they can't actually get out and do anything. Thanks, Jamie. Okay, thanks Ian and Claire. As uh, we're just going to summarise now, but one of the key things I said at the beginning is about how we, you know, we work together and make so many decisions together. But actually, one of the big things we realised quite quickly was we had to move fast. And as a result, having a lot of bureaucracy and lots of meetings to decide things wasn't going to help, especially as not everyone in our team was as tech savvy as some. So, you know, we had to let, you know, Ian and Claire, essentially, they're the ones who drove this, we had to let them get on with it. Um, I myself, I'm not too bad at technology, but as well as being a science teacher, I was also head of curriculum at my school. So with everything that was going on, there was a lot of changes. So I was so grateful to have people like Ian and Claire in my, in my team who could just get on with it. And they did a, a fantastic job, as you can see. Um, we, we made as much use as we could of the, the free services. And like Claire said, we're going to carry on with Zoom uh, because and pay for it because we want to carry on with Imogen Wednesdays. That engaged a whole new group of people um that that weren't engaging before and actually some of our members who live internationally as well now which is fantastic we're going to keep it going on thursday nights as well for our club nights we're going to have a massive tv put up in the observatory common area 
so people can drop in and out during the the, the evening and, uh, and 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 see what we're doing and, and talk to us as well so even those who can't access it physically will still be able to access it virtually um but as we've said the key here is to start simple start small start off with a zoom with a few people try it out try it out all the different features uh there's things that we we've not used too much yet like breakout rooms and so on which we you know which we could easily use if we wanted to if people want to have separate conversations and i think sometimes we've been tempted to do that haven't we claire when people have uh been dominating the conversation maybe throw them in a breakout room with someone else uh, but you know there, there's lots of opportunities there as well always have a plan b uh we even had to use that for myself uh in uh, september when we had one of our early talks i came down sick was convinced it was covid had the test and everything it's just a bad bit of man flu uh but we unfortunately i had a, a, a lesson i'd already recorded for some a, for a, a level kids which uh we then shared um uh, with everyone so we did have a plan b there and we often have a plan b and just finally just be persistent Okay, at first, not a lot of people will turn up. It may be tough, but word of mouth spreads. People get more confident with technology and it grows. And as with everything we've done, it always grows. And if you're confident and you have a bit of fun with it, it, it is really enjoyable. I mean, I, I can't make every Thursday night, but the ones I'm there, it, it totally de-stresses me for the week when I get to talk to everyone. And we're just talking about astronomy. The COVID world is left far behind and we can just focus on, on our passions, which is astronomy. And, uh, and that's essentially the sort of journey we've been on over the last year. Um, so we'd like to invite any questions now. Martin, I think you're throwing those our way. There are a few on the question panel, yes. Okay. Um, Paul, do you, want to, do you want to run through these now or at the end? I don't mind. I think we're, we're running down a little bit late. Maybe we could just do one quick question. Okay. Um, at the top of the list from Steve Tonkin um, says that he agrees with with um, MS Teams. Yeah, horrible thing. Totally agree with that one. Um, is there a reason you were or appear to be excluding the Cisco WebEx? Uh, it's the oldest uh, of the lot. Issues I out years ago, and is at least as good as Zoom. Uh, yeah, I, again, I refer back to my <laughs> previous comment about having used everything under the sun. Uh, I mean, WebEx is fine, but again, it does need a bit of setup, and uh, you know, it's again, it's not something people are necessarily familiar with. I think Zoom is kind of just one of those much easier things to get people to use. We had a lot of reluctance from people to actually even try this stuff to begin with, and Zoom is just one of those things. It just worked uh, much easier. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking for 25 years of trying to get people to make this stuff work uh, when it's in their only interest to do so. Never mind when it's people who are unsure or unwilling. So. I think I, would, I wouldn't rule it out if you've got access to it. Whatever works for you, but yeah. for us, Zoom mm. is just, just the best option. Righty ho, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we need to move on, I think, now. Um, so, Lucinda. Um... Hello, yes, hi. Hi there, Lucinda. So, our next speaker is uh, Lucinda Offer, who is uh, with the Royal Astronomical Society and is uh, one of their outreach officers and also their uh, event manager. And uh, many of you may know Lucinda's face from uh, both uh, the hosting of National Astronomy Week uh, back in November. Uh, and also, of course, if you go to the RES's excellent uh, YouTube site, there are a lot of the videos there that feature Lucinda as the host. So Lucinda is now going to talk about uh, how to effectively extend your use of uh, Zoom. We could have used her as a consultant maybe for today to uh, make things a bit more smoothly. Over to you, Lucinda. Hello. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I and mean, I apologize to everyone that I am unwell, but um, I'm, I'm over the hump. So, um, and I don't have COVID. I just got my clear today, this morning. So I'm really happy and happy to be here with you. And also um, happy that this is occurring because I would love it for more astronomical societies to offer um, and share everything that you're doing out there, all the important things, and, and especially the night sky when there are clear skies. Um, and that was part of being chair of the National Astronomy Week. Um, something what Paul is doing now is what we also wanted to do, but we only have so much time um, uh, that we could have, because I did want to also turn it into something educational. So I'm really glad that um, Paul is having this for you today. So what he's asked me to do is talk a little bit about YouTube, YouTube uploading and live streaming. 
Um, and so I quickly prepared these slides because I wasn't sure I was going to make it today. Um, uh, but I'm, uh, I, I think I'm okay to be here. So um, and we even had someone um, ill during NAW. So I figured if um, it, was, it was the guy who did the Mars globe and the Earth globe, and I thought if he could be there for our National Astronomy Week and he had COVID, then there's no excuse for me not to be here today. <laughs> So um, what's my experience? Well, I mean, I've been using Zoom. I'm originally from Silicon Valley, California, and I've been using Zoom since it's been out. Um, I also did a podcast called Mars Talk in 2016, and I, I'm going to try to share some of um, uh, that in some of those YouTube channels in a second to show you uh, kind of the, some of the work that I did and what you could possibly create. Um, I've also did a six hour Jupiter uh, moons looking at um, Jupiter's moons um, uh, crossing the disk. Uh, live stream, six hour live stream, which was actually action packed and a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I've done, I dealt, I was the person who uh, um, uh, did all the back end uh, for the Venus phosphine announcement, that worldwide uh, announcement of uh, possible uh, molecules of life um, in the uh, clouds of Venus or atmosphere of Venus. And that was actually a, a simulcast. So, um, and Ian. Um, who did his great, uh, Ian and Claire, who did their presentation. Ian was part of NAW and mentioned something that uh, you couldn't do one or the other. You couldn't do both Facebook and YouTube on Zoom. You can um, if you use something called uh, realstream.io, um, which I probably won't get into. I would, I would agree with Ian, start out slow and uh, just try a live stream either on Facebook or YouTube. And I agree that YouTube is probably um, the best uh, format for that. Um, I also did the, our RAS community meetings with, you know, the UK Space Agency and SDFC and ESA. Um, we did this huge Mars online conference in 2020. We had over 60,000 people because we had Elon Musk join us. Um, and then, of course, I hosted the National Astronomy Week in 2020 and set them up as an organization to be able to do live streaming uh, for that uh, 10 days for the nation, which was pretty fun. And who can do this? Again, um, anyone, anyone who is willing and wanting to learn. Uh, and I agree with Ian again, it just takes some practice, uh, you know, try doing something with your kids or with your neighbors or with your family uh, just for fun and go from there. Um, it can be as simple or as complex as you want it to be. Uh, you want someone in your organization who it, they may already tinker with stuff like this already and you may not know about it. So you might wanna just ask anyone in your organization or your society, has anyone done YouTube? Does anyone have a YouTube channel? And just for fun, I'm oh, sorry, I went to the next page. I think, um, uh, hold on one second. There we go, where was I? There I am. I was moving over to the attendees. I was wanting to, I'm gonna lower everyone's hands because I can do that because I'm co-host. I just wanna see a, um, a show of hands, you can go to your Zoom and there's a click, um, you know, raise your hand in the participants window, I believe. Any of you have, not yet, <laughs> any of you, <laughs> wait for my question. Um, how many of you already have a YouTube account, a, an actual YouTube account? So how many people, how, okay, wow, excellent. See, so already, you guys are already almost there. All right. That's fantastic. I'm gonna lower your hands again and I'm gonna ask a, a different question. So stop raising your hands, thank you. Um, so here's the next question. How many of your organizations have a YouTube channel? How many of your societies have a YouTube channel? Okay, so you guys are already there. All right, let me just, oh wow, a lot of you. You guys already know what you're doing. <laughs> it sounds like, okay, here, I'm gonna lower your hands again. Uh, how many of you societies have already live streamed? Okay, all right. All right, excellent. So a portion of this group, that's excellent, good. So some of you already know what I'm talking about. Another of you, you're just getting started or haven't even started, so don't worry about it. Um, a lot of these tools, again, are free and are easy, um, and I'm gonna do my best in the time that I have left. Uh, to go over some of them. Um, so again, if you haven't done any of this, don't worry about it. You, I'm sure there's someone in your society or in your local community who may want to volunteer. Um, and they may be really young because young people or the millennials love YouTube and they, they don't even care about TV. They think TV is, is passe now and that all they watch is YouTube. That's who you want in your society probably to take something like this 
on for you. And they won't be present in the, in the front. They will do all the back end work for you to, to, to showcase your society. Um, so they'll be really good at multitasking. And so again, those are just someone else who's already dabbled in YouTube and streaming possibly. Okay. So again, you can make this as complex or as simple as you want. Uh, for me and for the Royal Astronomical Society at minimum, to prepare for an event, I have to do uh, approximately 65 steps, uh, anywhere from obtaining a speaker in advance, months in advance, uh, a year in advance sometimes, setting up my Zoom webinar uh, for to have that link, that link never can change because then it's gonna go out and promote everywhere. So you never wanna, you wanna make sure that link is precious and kept uh, sacred uh, and never changed because it's gonna go out on newsletters, on emails, promote it everywhere. I have to create a PowerPoint slide. At minimum, you should create some sort of slide that was going to go up on YouTube and be as your holding page um, or that you'll use in promotion. So have something where you can create a slide or do some sort of graphic image. So you have to think about that too. What kind of graphic image do you want to connect to this event you're going to have? Um, I have to create the connection between YouTube and live stream. Um, this is all done way in advance. Uh, and again, that link cannot change. So make sure nothing happens to disturb that link. And there'll be a YouTube holding page uh, that we set out for RAS um, so that our fellows and our members, uh, followers on YouTube can um, set a reminder. So it'll, YouTube will remind them when our event starts. We also use events uh, bright as well. Um, but again, so to make an, an invite, so all those links can't change so that it's all consistent so that when our event's ready to go, nothing's amiss. You know, I have to also publish this to the website, again, with those same links, they can't change. And I have to alert the public through our comms team, let our staff members know to get it out in our newsletter. So these are things that the first speakers have already touched on that are really important um, in promoting your event. Um, and then there are more steps that I'm probably not gonna go into too much, things that I do two days before, during the event and after. Those will have to be a whole nother um, talk. <laughs> um, so live stream direct, you can do it as easy as that. If you had a Facebook profile, you could probably turn on your phone and start live streaming immediately. Just make sure that when you do live stream, don't hold your phone in this direction, hold it in this direction. Uh, because otherwise you'll, um, you won't get a proper uh, setup for YouTube. So always remember to probably want your camera at the top. So something like that where your camera's at the top. So always hold it in um, uh, the landscape view and not in the, um, oh, what's the other one called? I can't think right now. So uh, forgive me. Um, let's see what else. Uh, create an account. So a lot of you already have an account on YouTube, which is excellent. Um, I was gonna go through kind of the permissions in those. So for those of them who haven't done that, um, but if you wanted it to be so simple, it could be as that. You couldn't live stream from your phone on YouTube because YouTube has lots of restrictions. They wanna make sure before anyone live streams from their phone on YouTube, uh, that they have at least a thousand subscribers. So you may have already have to create content um, up on your YouTube channel. Uh, maybe that's a video that you created personally and you upload it to YouTube and you've accumulated a thousand subscribers then you can live stream direct from YouTube. And someone like the Linnaean Society actually does that. They don't use anything else. They don't use Zoom. They just put up a camera um, in their, um, in their um, hall, in their lecture theater, and they um, immediately direct live stream from a, a mobile phone or a camera at, at the Linnaean Society. Um, so they don't bother with Zoom. Um, and that's something you could do too. So you don't feel like you have to use the Zoom tool. Um, okay, uh, and one thing I haven't mentioned is, um, I don't know, I think, um, you know, Ian does something very complex like an OBS, which is um, open broadcasting uh, system, I think, or open broadcasting, I can't think of my head, I've got the illness brain. Um, so, uh, and Zoom is basically that, it's an OBS. It's, uh, and it's very simplified. It's sort of like using a PC and, and an Apple, apologies to those PC users. Um, but for me, Apple, I know, grew up as knowing is very user friendly. And that's what Zoom is. Zoom is a very user friendly OBS system. So I highly recommend Zoom. Um, and I know there was a, some issues initially with some of its security um, on Zoom. And, and, and that's why I would recommend Zoom now because, because they had that initial issues with the public and security and all that, they are now working super hard to make sure it's secure. So I would say they're probably the most secure um, online tool 
uh, for um, doing meetings and webinars um, now because of that uh, public backlash. So setting up a YouTube channel, uh, a YouTube account, if you don't already have one or a Google account, you would just go to Google, there would be a sign in because if you've never signed in before, and they would have you sign in, you could do that directly from YouTube. So that's what this is. And um, I've got two Bix in brackets there because if you Google two Bix on YouTube, or you, um, they have all these like how to videos, how to set up um, your YouTube channel. So T-U-B-I-C-S, just put that in YouTube and they'll have all these um, how-to videos for you to do this. So you create an account. Uh, you, you can do one for either yourself or your, for your society. So if you're doing one for your society on their behalf, you wanna click on manage my business. This is all free. Um, you would put in, if you're the representative for your society, you would put in uh, your first and last name and all that information. They would want also you to confirm with a, an actual phone number. So if you're going to use a society phone number or your personal phone number, you need to discuss that. Confirmations, of course, tick all the boxes for agreements. Um, and Google's being really sure about security this time. So um, you know they will text you a confirmation number that you will have to put into the system to make sure you're a real person. Um, and then you're going to sign in because you've just created an account. Now you have to sign in again or sign in properly. Um, and they'll have your personal information there. But if you want to create a personal YouTube uh, page, then you'll just go straight to create channel. Um, but if you want to do it under your society's name, then you want to click on use a business or other name and create a branded account. And then that will take you to creating a brand account. Um, and this was something I had to have uh, National Astronomy Week do because they didn't have uh, a YouTube channel when we did NAW this week, this year, or sorry, last year uh, for 2020. And of course we went online because of COVID um, and it was a great success. One important thing I want you to know, um, once you set up your YouTube channel uh, you, and you signed in, you created your account, excuse me, then you have to create a channel uh, so it's, that's very simple by going into YouTube and, and create your channel um, and it'll ask you for some details. And then you have to go into settings and, uh, and enable your live streaming in YouTube. And I want to give you a heads up because this happens to a lot of organizations where they think they can immediately live stream once they've enabled it in settings and they can't. You have to wait approximately 24 hours for YouTube to activate. So make sure you enable um, uh, live streaming in YouTube ahead of your event so that you don't um, uh, go without on the day. Um, I was going to show you a quick uh, run around. I don't know if I have time to check in with Paul really quick because I know we're running late. So I don't know how much more you want me to show. Uh, it's up to you. I think um, I, I think Lucinda carry carry on. We're we're okay, and uh, if necessary, we'll we'll run into the break and just have a slightly shorter break. Okay. I'm going to share a different screen now. Uh, let's see here, this one. One more thing about sharing your screen in Zoom, and uh, there's a lot more about Zoom and, and starting off a, a webinar so that you could do like a practice session with them. Those are some of the things I do with my um, speakers is I'll do a practice session privately before making a webinar live. And then um, there's a lot, a lot to learn, but I think once you get stuck in, you will. Yes, this is the one. And also when I share on Zoom, sometimes if I'm doing live video, I'll click on Zoom, share sound and optimize video clip. And that's kind of interesting. This is back in Zoom if I'm sharing and I'm gonna show a video. If I do click those two things in my share window and I'm playing a video, I can have my own audio off and my camera off and all my attendees will be able to hear and see my video, which is great because I can go make a cup of tea while the video is playing and I know they're listening, they can hear everything fine. So that's just a tip to do in Zoom when I go to share. So I'm gonna share a different screen now, I'm sharing some YouTube screens. Again, this is Linnaean Society. This is the channel they've created uh, and they um, stream directly from YouTube. Um, and they also have a nice landing video that plays when people go to their website. They've all got a nice um, uh, organization of their content. And if you have no content, well, you'll start from a very blank page. But as you accumulate content, you can also organize it very nicely like the Linnaean has. Another organization, um, I don't know if Paul mentioned, I am also the executive director of the Mars Society worldwide. So I overlook chapters. Um, uh, what it is, is it's basically Mars analog research that I've done for 20 years. 
Um, and I mentioned a conference we did with Elon Musk. Uh, we had over 60,000 members attend that conference. We also have a landing video. I think that's a really uh, great thing to do. I'm just gonna play it really quickly. Sometime in the next few decades, humans will leave this planet to live in another world. So you want it to have some impact, that video that you have as your landing video. So I just sort of, that was the sound and very simplified and some imagery to inspire people to see more of your content. And so we have videos here from the convention we had earlier. Um, and then we've got tons of, these are the podcasts I did a couple of years ago um, that started to create content. I, I, I would, we would record these on our home computers and then upload them to YouTube. And the way you do that is right here, you can create something here. Let me see if this, this gives me the opportunity to upload a video. So any content that I have and I've recorded on my own computer and I've edited it, I can then upload it later to um, YouTube. And just to give you a, an idea here, once you, it takes a while to upload to YouTube and then it takes a while for YouTube to process that video. Um, uh, the difference is if you did a live stream, it would immediately be there. There'd be a small delay. There's like a 20 second delay when you live stream on YouTube, but basically it's, it's gonna go up and be live as long as you've made it public. You can also live stream privately, which is something I do for RAS, is I live stream a meeting privately. And then if, um, but then we can edit in YouTube or I can download it and edit in my own software and then re-upload um, it later. And I like that. I like live streaming private because it's already on YouTube and we can immediately get it live, uh, edit it really quickly in YouTube and get it up onto our YouTube channel. Um, and then finally, I'm showing uh, you the Royal Astronomical Society's uh, channel. So again, once you've signed in and created your account, you can then create your channel. Um, I manage lots of uh, different um, accounts. So the National Astronomy Week, the Royal Astro, and of course, Mars Society isn't here. Um, but I'll show you, I have a personal account on YouTube. And if I go there, I have no channel. So this is not my channel. It's gonna ask me to create a channel. And so I can create a channel. Um, so I don't, I just wanted to give you an idea that if you haven't one, it would tell you is <laughs> you'd have to create a channel. Um, so let me switch back to um, RAS. So I can switch among all my different Google accounts, um, which is really nice and easy that they've built that in. Um, let me see, what else was I gonna show you on here? YouTube Studio is basically where I go to live stream. And I'm just gonna show you, this shows all our analytics, uh, uh, but to um, create a live stream, I need to come here and I wanna go live. And I'm gonna click on that. It's not gonna have me go live right now unless I want it to. So don't be afraid, but it's basically where I would schedule a stream. Uh, I manage all the streams here. Um, here's an old one I'm not worried about. Um, I'm gonna, this is one that's, uh, that we just had. Uh, and so this is what it looks like when you have created a, uh, a live stream in YouTube. So I would come to YouTube studio and it would ask me schedule a stream I would click on schedule stream and I could either reuse settings from all my previous ones, or I could just create a new one, create a new one. And basically it asks you to, do you want it public or private? All these things. And you could do all this online. You could find out information online on YouTube, how you would do this. Um, but um, you can create a title, add your description. The description is very long. And this is where I said, when you create a PowerPoint slide, you would upload it here and it's usually 1280 by 780. As long as you make it, save it as a 1280 by 780 uh, PNG, you can pop it right in here and it needs to be under two megabytes. Um, so that's all you have to make sure you do. Um, here, uh, my tip here is if you select yes, made for kids, YouTube will shut off your chat. You will not be able to chat on YouTube because it's, they're safeguarding, protecting children. So I always click on no, it's not made for kids. And then that enables my chat so I can chat. So um, you know, we all wanna protect children and that's why they do that. It's a really good idea. And then you create your stream. And once you've created your stream, it creates this for you. This is the back end of YouTube for live streaming. Um, I usually have an enable auto start. So that means when I'm in Zoom and I tell Zoom I'm ready to live stream, it begins to connect to YouTube for me. And as soon as I've connected, it automatically starts um, live streaming for me. If I disable that, 
all, all that happens is I have to wait for this go live button to turn blue or red. I think it, it pops up and it says, you know, go live and I click on that and then it goes, it goes live when I'm ready. Um, you could also do the auto stop and enable DVR. So you want it to digital record. You definitely want that. Um, but this is really the important information, your stream keys, your stream URL. Those two things are the things you really want to copy. So they make it really easy for you to copy and paste. Um, and usually they also are gonna want to know what's the shareable link. And the shareable link is right here, these three little dots, you get the shareable link. That's the link you use to promote your event. Um, and that link then uh, takes you to the holding page uh, for that event. So here's the holding page that I set up uh, for a, a lecture. Um, and it allows people, this has already happened, this is old. It usually has, um, let's see, uh, I think the other ones are already also old too. It allows people to set a reminder here and it's saying, you know, be prepared for this coming up in the next five days as a counter counting down to when it will happen. Um, let's see, where else was I? I think that's pretty much it here. If I'll check in with Paul. Paul, do you want me to continue? Have you got so much more to go through? Um, just a few more, I think a few more slides, I think. Okay, um, I'm a bit conscious of time because we, we've overrun a little while. Um, There's a lot to know and I would just suggest if you want to quit here, go on YouTube and, um, or um, you know, if Paul wants to do more of these, or I'd be happy to record um, a demo. There's a lot more information to learn. So um, uh, I'll leave it at that and uh, we can go to Q&A. Maybe maybe we could ask you to do um to do a, a video um going into to more detail and uh, to go up onto our FAS um, web page afterwards. Sounds good. Yeah, um, maybe Martin, if you want to do a question. Okay, um, going to the bottom of the list uh, for Lucinda. Then um, let's start here. Can a highlight video? be set on the channel of a pers personal YouTube account or can it, or is it just on a brand account? Uh, um, I, yes, I believe it can because uh, funny enough, National Astronomy Week uh, put up a, per made a personal YouTube channel and you did change that to a brand channel. I believe you can, I, I'd have to double check, um, but I can check that really quick and get back to you so we can move on to other questions. Okay. I think because uh, we're running uh, a little late, maybe we'll move straight on to um, to Peter's talk. Uh, and don't forget, we've got a question and answer session as well before the break. So some of the questions that are not getting asked right now, we can ask later on. So um, we have the next talk by uh, Peter, who's going to uh, talk about um, the background of the, to the virus and safety issues. Uh, Peter has um, Peter uh, is a uh, was a consultant anaesthetist uh, for 32 years, uh, a director of an intensive care unit for 25 years. He has a BSc in immunology and virology, uh, and uh, is a member of the National Council for Eye Anesthesia. anesthesia uh, and he's now uh, a GP. So I'll uh, I'll hand you over to uh, to Peter. Hi there. Um Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sadly not a GP at the moment. I'm a retired, uh, almost all medical stuff, but uh, I'm also uh, an enthusiastic, very amateur astronomer. Uh, thank you for asking me to talk on this uh, matter. I hope it's not too grim. Um, and uh, I'll just bash on here. And I've been asked really to, to give an overview of the coronavirus family and the the thing, the way it impacts on our lives. The coronavirus family, of which COVID is one, uh, all, <clears throat> all have these spikes that uh, uh, give the name to the family of a corona or a crown. So they all have characteristics. And these are the, the current seven main coronaviruses. The bottom four, so starting from, um, starting from, uh, can you see uh, the thing uh, the bottom four starting from uh, HCOV and NL63, the bottom four of those viruses 
produce mild respiratory illnesses. They're mostly not uh, dangerous to people unless they have other comid comorbidities. And uh, between a third and a quarter of the common colds that we get are due to those four viruses. Your so slides have dropped out. Sorry? Your slides have dropped out. Okay. So why is that? Is that back? Are they still there? No. Do I need to go back and, uh, for some reason, screen share? Yes, you might need to go back and do the screen sharing, Peter. Yeah. Okay, so I put that as the, is that better? Yes, we can see that now, yes. Okay. Um, should I just go back one? So, um, yeah, so the bottom four, common cold. Uh, the top three are much more serious. So the second one down is the SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which we saw around about 2003, mostly in Southeast Asia. Um, and it did get a few cases around wor worldwide, but uh, didn't really impact the West too much. The MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, 2012, uh, was around Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia, but it became more widespread, but didn't quite get to pandemic status. The deaths from those two were in the thousands and um, didn't really impact too greatly on the United Kingdom. But the SARS-CoV-2 is the it, COVID is the uh, the bad boy of this whole group, and the COVID-19, and it's named 19 because it was discovered in 2019, and in fact some specialists are talking about calling some of the new variants COVID-20, as in 2020. Uh, COVID-19 has a much higher mortality. It's difficult to give an actual mortality, but certainly um, two to five percent, but it depends really on um, which of the strains we're talking about and what sort of treatment and how severe the diseases are and how what other comorbidities the patient has. So high morbidity, morbidity and mortality compared to the other SARS and MERS and also uh, much greater than uh, the ordinary influenza that we get. So that's the uh, coronavirus family. So COVID-19 transmission. I think we've heard a lot about this over the, the year. We've all uh, been um, exposed to the, the ideas of uh, how we get the COVID, but I think it's worth just reiterating. Primarily, it's, it's respiratory transmission. So through aerosol or droplets, through coughing, sneezing, any, and just really being in close proximity to somebody with the virus. You could also get it from contact. That's either surfaces or, or other people contact. Uh, obviously, shaking hands or hugging people, being very close to their, to their mouths or noses is a, a, a big danger in terms of transmission. The, the surface, it depends upon the type of surface that we talk about. And there's a great deal of research still going on about that but it certainly seems to vary greatly between the surfaces as to how long the virus hangs around. Uh, metal can be as much as five days, whereas ordinary metal, so door handles, that sort of thing, where stainless steel can be down to two or three days, and some types of paper can be as little as a few minutes. So it does vary greatly between the type of surfaces we're talking about. There's also a possibility of spread transmission via the conjunctiva, um, so through the, the surface of the eyeball um, and tracking down through the tear duct and infecting. This is still quite uh, uh, controversial and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide or two. Incubation time, well it was initially put as between 5 and 14 days and has been reduced down to about 10 to 12 days, but it's very difficult to be absolutely sure. Um, and partly that is due to the asymptomatic symptomatic problems. And in terms of being infectious, if you're symptomatic, then you can be symptomatic before the five days. 
the virus is very clever at um, putting in little bits of genetic material into our cells when it infects them in delaying our um, immune response to the virus, which means that it has a few days when you don't feel sick and don't show any signs of sickness, when in fact it is uh, proliferating its numbers and getting around your mod body more and also um, making other people um, infectious. It's believed that one of the things it can do is to cause the repetitive cough. It uh, programs you to cough. It's not due to an infection as such, but it is the virus's way of spreading to the next person by enabling you to cough more on a regular basis. And of course, if you're asymptomatic, then all the time that you have the virus, you're showing no symptoms but you are spreading the virus. And it's amongst this group of people that we have the super spreaders who don't know they're ill, but are still spreading the virus around. Um, exposure to ultraviolet light weakens and degrades the virus. So it's one of the reasons being outdoors in, in the sunshine is a, an assistance to preventing you get the disease. And I think it's obvious from these what increases your risks uh, of getting the disease, getting the virus, any close proximity to other people, especially touching them. And we have all sorts of distances being bandied around, it's around the world's different. Uh, two meters has been um, mooted as the, the possible um, uh, limit to which the aerosols and droplets uh, spread. But I think there's a lot of feeling much researchers that this may not be enough, especially in the closed spaces. I was reminded that the other day, walking down my lane with my dog, I stopped and pulled to one side to allow a couple of people to go past me and they were never closer to me than 12 feet at least and as they moved away from me and I was still standing there 12 feet away I could smell the um, perfume of the lady who was walking past and it just struck me that if I can smell the, the perfume then aerosols and droplets could particularly aerosols could, could almost certainly get as far as I was. Enclosed spaces are of course, much worse, especially poorly ventilated ones. And we mustn't be fooled by ventilation systems. Many of them are um, just recycling the same air and in fact, or move it to another part of the building. So the ventilation has to be good. And if necessary, we must open windows in order to ventilate the, um, the room that you're in. There was some rather strange um, ideas from the government over the Christmas period to say that if you're having Christmas dinner, put grandmother right at the end of the table near the open window. I thought, given that this is December and quite cold, it didn't seem like very healthy for poor grandma. So, but ventilating the room with an open window, if you can, it would be a good idea. Enclosed spaces are also very time, time sensitive. And the more minutes you spend in an enclosed space, especially a poorly ventilated one with other people, the more risk you have of picking the virus up if it's there. Um, if you don't wear a mask, then your risks are increased. Initially, I think Father Fool heartedly, heartedly, we said you didn't need to wear masks, but I think increasingly we're realizing that wearing a mask whenever you can, whenever seems appropriate in any high risk situation has got to decrease your chances of um, getting the virus. Eye protection I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's another area. But there's no doubt the lack of good hand washing, personal hygiene, touching hand, if you touch hands or touch surfaces, shake hands and then touch your face, your mouth, your nose or your eyes, then you increase your risks. Um, weather, hot weather, unfortunately doesn't disturb the virus. There are many outbreaks in very hot countries around the world and the virus doesn't seem to mind very cold uh, conditions. There were several outbreaks in German meat packing factories in the freezing departments. So that doesn't help either. How to slow the spread of coronavirus? Well, I think this is, again, we've heard so much about this and I think we're getting all getting a pretty good idea of how to go about it. Wash your hands thoroughly and often with soap and water. Um, an alcohol-based um, sanitizer may be used as a substitute but soap and water are preferable and much better. The virus is in a little lipid package and soap and water destroy the, the, the package very easily. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth as much as possible. 
do not come into physical contact with people who are infected or may be infected with the virus, if at all possible. And when in public, two meters at least between you and other people. If you cough or sneeze, cover your mouth and nose with a tissue, dispose of the tissue in a covered bin. If you haven't got a tissue, the bend of your elbow uh, would be useful, but I do worry about that as being a reservoir for spreading the virus at a later date. Wear mask as much as possible, eye protection, we'll talk about that at its use, and disposable gloves where at all possible. Um, and I think this is particularly relevant to the astronomy world, sterilization of all equipment, especially if it's being shared, for instance, on an outreach um, evening. Um, it must be very carefully looked at and things wiped and cleaned. Um, other sanitizers has been raised. There are, there are all sorts of ones on the market, Baco Ban, Zoo No. Um, I think we have to be a little cautious. Um, soap and water is undoubtedly preferable, but may not be suitable for all types of cleaning, all types of equipment. And just going online, it's obvious that a, that the pandemic has caused an outbreak of, of new sanitizers on the market. And it's opened up a lot of companies who didn't make sanitizers in the past to make them. And I've found already a couple of um, court cases and uh, fines for Zoo No uh, by the Australian government uh, for not going through the proper um, and making claims of 99.99% um, coverage against coronavirus and HIV and Ebola when there was no evidence they'd actually gone through the statutory requirements and they've uh, companies have been fined for making claims that they had no reason to to give so I think we have to be a little bit careful there back of ban I can't find anything against and you know the aeronautics use it on airplanes and such like plastic wraps is a useful idea of, of covering covering keypads for instance having disposable wraps and having it for one per one set perhaps covering other parts of equipment, um, perhaps even um, um, telescopes could be cut partially covered with protective um, wraps. In closed places, ensure good ventilation, open windows if possible, and just make sure there's plenty of space within the room uh, for the number of people who are there. Can you catch COVID through your eyes? Through, uh, through the conjunctiva, the covering of your eyes. The Chinese experts, when they first faced COVID, um, found that they had a number of uh, their uh, experts who were getting COVID, despite having full Hazchem's equipment and proper masks, gloves, suits. And they came to the, the possibility that they were actually get, con getting it through the, the conjunctiva of their eyes because they weren't wearing goggles at the time. And this was reported in The Lancet in 2020. And COVID conjunctivitis is found as uh, in 3% of people um, presenting with COVID symptoms. And sometimes the, the conjunctivitis is, the, is, the, is the, 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 um, the sign that they have COVID and they go on to be tested positive. Um, so, but at the moment, no COVID has been actually detected in the tear ducts. And it has been wondered whether at that time, whether this was a COVID infection of the lungs which was backtracking, if you like, into the tears, into the eyes. So, but there was a, um, an immunologist in the States, quite well known, a, a virologist and immunologist, Joseph Fair, who got very severe COVID um, on a flight uh, in the USA, despite wearing mask and gloves and taking all precautions. And he came to the conclusion that what, because he wasn't wearing masks, I wasn't wearing glasses and the flight crew weren't wearing masks. So the John Hopkins researchers looked on the conjunctiva for the receptors that um, COVID has to bind onto. It has a, has a particular liking for ACE2 receptors. These are little, little receptor sites which are found all over the body, which is why COVID hits so many organs around the body. And they found ACE2 receptors on the conjunctiva of the eye, which is the prime target for COVID-19, opening up the possibility of infection by the conjunctiva. And the Chinese study showed that people wearing glasses for more than eight hours a day 
had significantly less likely, likelihood to get COVID-19. Um, there are recommendations. Uh, we, uh, I was given some Glasgow research guidelines for, uh, for researchers uh, in the laboratories there using uh, microscopes, which may be very pertinent to our use. And they gave quite useful recommendations that uh, if anybody's interested, then I can send the link uh, on to them um, about uh, disinfecting um, and shared microscopes, which is obviously quite similar to what we are doing. This may be quite likely because we do know that routine drugs are routinely absorbed through the conjunctiva of the eye. So we know that there is a route there. There's no absolute answer, but it does seem prudent to use goggles, glasses or face shield wherever there's a high risk. My conclusions. We all really know what to do. We just need to keep doing it. Uh, to quote the great leader, hands, face, space. We have to remember we had the smallpox vaccine for over 200 years before we eradicated it. That was Jenna back in 1798. Even with vaccination underway, normal life will not be possible for many months, if at all this year. Every time mutations, they just complicate things. The longer COVID is with us, the more possibility of mutations that there are. We may have to learn to live alongside this virus for some time. It may well become endemic as are other viruses, such as other coronaviruses, herpes viruses, etc. When we begin to return to normal, outreach initiatives in the flesh, as it were, person to person, will have to take, abide by the, the above principles that we've looked at here. In the meantime, I believe that innovative virtual outreach sessions, as we've been really hearing, that gives me great hope for what I've been hearing so far, may have to fill, in fact, will have to fill the void. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Martin, do you want to choose a question to ask, uh, ask Peter? Okay, here's a quick one that came in. Are nasal sprays effective against COVID? Sorry, what was the question? Are nasal sprays effective against COVID? Nasal sprays of what? Do we know? No, uh, health hasn't said yet, but he might do in a second. Right, okay. Um, have I got anything else for you? There's a comment about disinfecting eyepieces, um, but yes, I think that info is few and far between, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just trying to get back to my Zoom. Yes. Have I come back? I haven't come back out of Zoom, have I? So yeah, anyway, I'll get back to the back. Here we go. Uh, okay, um, so we'll, we'll, shall we move on? And um, we'll, if there are other questions to be asked, we'll we'll go for those in the Q and A session. We may run slightly into the break uh, before, and we'll try and resume the, the second session at the uh, at the stated time. So our next speaker, thank you very much, Peter. Yeah. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ian Dandy, who is going to talk about uh, doing uh, risk assessments, in particular COVID safe uh, risk assessments and uh, maybe discuss also some of the uh, insurance questions that some of you have asked. Um, Ian started life um, as, as, a, as a motor vehicle bodybuilder and joined the, the Metropolitan Police for a while, a British Rail, uh, but then moved to work in health and safety for over 30 years in various positions uh, for British, British Rail as, as a risk consultant um, and, and has worked in the insurance industry for some time. So um, I'll hand you over to Ian. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, just try to uh, share my screen. Um, okay, hopefully everybody can see that one. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, just to um, back up what uh, um, what uh, Paul said, um, I'm actually a member of uh, Preston and District Astronomical Society, uh, very much an amateur astronomer, but uh, very, very keen. And um, obviously, as uh, part of the, you know, just uh, trying to help out with the society, I was asked to get involved with um, helping with risk assessments and um, just in general health and safety advice. So 
um, carried out a number of assessments prior to the uh, COVID uh, outbreak um, for various events, things like um, transits of Mercury and things like um, watching the sun and that kind of thing, and also opening up our local observatory. So what I want to do this afternoon really is um, not to talk about any specific hazards. I think Peter's just made a marvellous job of covering that, but I just want to go through the, like, the uh, practical kind of um, elements of carrying out a risk assessment. So why we do it and how to do it. Um, what I want to sort of emphasize right from the start is this, this uh, shouldn't really be seen as a, a complicated process. I know a lot of people um, some ways are a little bit frightened of risk assessment, but there's no need to be. Try and keep things simple. Try not to overcomplicate things. The thing to remember though is risk assessment itself is actually a thought process um, it's impossible to actually record the actual risk assessment. What we're really doing is providing a record to, you know, to show that we've done it and also as a source of reference. But the risk assessment itself is really something that we do sort of um, every day, really. And if we were to define what exactly is a risk assessment, well, it's quite simple. It's just a careful examination of anything which may cause harm. Simple as that. And what we probably don't realise is we, we do it all the time. Um, hopefully, uh, we're now all aware, or we should be following Peter's talk even more so about the dangers of COVID. So hopefully, every time we leave uh, leave home, every time we go out for any essential sort of errands or anything like that, hopefully, we're assessing the risk of potential exposure to COVID. Even more fundamental, we go out, we walk in the street, it's icy outside, what are the chances of slipping? So we're doing risk assessments all the time and it's really just the way that our brain sort of, if you like, computes information and ultimately keeps us safe. Thinking more about um, our activities in a society, what risk assessment also allows us to do is it allows us to organise and engage in what might be thought of as higher risk activities. It's all too easy and it happens quite a lot in the media, probably people who've been involved with children and with school trips and things like that have probably heard all the sort of media kind of coverage where children can't play conkers anymore, they can't go on school trips because it isn't safe. And it's very easy to blame safety, to blame insurance requirements and things like that. But in reality, if we actually do carry out a suitable risk assessment, it actually helps us to organise these events and look at the actual risks and think, well, actually, we can manage this, we can control it. And if we can actually control risks, then there's no reason why we can't go ahead with the event that we were planning all along. We, for, we can make it safe and risk assessment is a way to do that. What it also does, I mean, I was asked to obviously um, mention things about insurance. It does ensure that we fulfil our duty of care because as I'm sure you're aware, if we do put an event on and we are inviting members or non-members or members of the public to attend our events, we do have a duty of care to look after people and to make sure that we, we don't cause any harm or cause that person any injury. So by doing a risk assessment, it will help us to fulfil our duty of care. Ultimately, reduces the risk of injury, loss, damage, not only to our visitors and to our members, but also to ourselves. If we've got any equipment or anything like that, then obviously we can control risk. We can obviously reduce the risks of, of harm from that. More importantly as well, it protects societies, organisers, volunteers, individuals from potential litigation. And that's obviously, uh, you know, one of the things that a lot of people are concerned about these days. And unfortunately, that does stop a lot of people from putting an event on in the first place. Quite often, it may be required, a risk assessment may be required to actually get approval for our events. Quite often, events are, he are held on maybe someone else's property. It may be that a society might want to use a local park in which case they might have to get a, a, approval from the local authority. It may be that we want to use some facilities, maybe at a local college or a local university, the village hall or something like that. And they might say, well, before we allow you to go ahead, we want to see a suitable risk assessment. So it might be required to put the event on in the first place. Quite often an insurance company will ask for a risk assessment simply because if there were to be any issues, there were to be any claims or anything like that, then, the risk assessment was one of the first things that would be asked for to help defend against insurance claims. So in a lot of ways, it's 
you know, um, useful to have that risk assessment in place. It comes as a little bit of an, of an assurance that you've looked at the event, you've looked at the potential hazards and you've controlled it. Quite often, and people get a little bit kind of uh, concerned about this, but who should complete a risk assessment? Well, to be honest, there's no right answer really. Um, and I always think it's always better if it's a small group activity. Um, you could say, well, uh, if you look at say someone with my background, obviously you've got a lot of background in health and safety. You could say, well, I know what the law says. I know what the insurance requirements are. I know how to fill a risk assessment pro forma out. But I'm relatively inexperienced in astronomy. I haven't helped to organize lots of events. A lot of people in our society and certainly a lot of people who are on the seminar today know a lot more than I do about organizing an astronomy event. There are people who've got lifetimes of experience in astronomy, far more than I'll ever have, and they know far more about the event that they're organizing than I do. So really, we need to involve a few people. Um, and I would suggest really, it should be part of the organizing committee's role. Uh, somebody maybe to facilitate the risk assessment, maybe somebody to offer to record the risk assessment, but who should actually complete the risk assessment? Well, I would say that uh, everybody's opinion is just as valid as anybody else's. So I would say organize a small team and um, get everybody's opinion, get as many different opinions as we can and ask for volunteers. It's always easier to get a little bit of help. Okay, so that's a little bit of background, um, but now fundamentally, how do we do it? Well, uh, lots and lots of guidance out there on the internet. I mean, um, certainly for a work situation, there's a lot of guidance from the health and safety executive and the, um, the methodology that they've chosen is what's known as the five steps approach, the five steps to risk assessment. So first of all, the first step is to identify the hazards. So who might be harmed and how? The next stage, well, look at estimating the risk. It's a risk, it's a risk assessment, not a hazard spotting exercise. So how likely is it that the hazard's going to happen? And if the hazard did happen, how serious would the outcome be? So risk is quite simply um, a calculation of two functions. It's the likelihood of the harmful event occurring and the potential severity if it does so. So there's lots and lots of ways of calculating that, but fundamentally we keep it simple and we just say, well, how likely is it to happen and how serious would the outcome be if it did? The next stage is we really need to evaluate the risk. Um, so if we have identified a risk, do we need to do something about it? The first thing to remember is we're not going to be eliminate every single risk out there. There's always going to be a risk. People are always going to be potentially at risk of slipping or tripping or bumping into somebody or something like that. We are never going to have a completely safe environment. But all we need to do is try to make things as safe as possible. So is there anything more that we need to do or have we done everything that we need to? Fundamentally, though, can we go ahead with the event? Um, there may be lots and lots of things that we're planning to do. And in actual fact, well, you know, uh, second thoughts, we've looked at it, we've thought about it. And actually, we may not be able to go ahead with that. We'd like to do it, but really, um, it wouldn't be suitable. It just wouldn't be safe. But in most cases, we can put some sensible control measures in place. And usually the event can uh, move along quite smoothly. All right, all well, that's a thought process so far, but then we do have to put pen to paper. Um, two reasons why we need to record things. Um, first of all, it's a source of information. Everybody who's gonna be involved in the event needs to know uh, what the hazards are and how we need to control them. So first and foremost, the risk assessment is a source of information. So we do do a risk assessment. We need to publish it, we need to make it available. We need to make sure that everybody who's concerned with the event needs to know basically that information. The second reason why we need to record things is that if things did go wrong and ultimately there was some kind of uh, has, uh, um, accident or something like that, God forbid, we hope there wouldn't be, but if the worst happens and we do end up maybe having to defend a claim or something, then that risk assessment could be, you know, our sort of, like, our proof that we've done everything reasonably practicable and we've done everything we could to prevent harm. And that's why insurance companies and event organisers want to see these risk assessments. The final step in the five stage process is we need to review the risk assessment and we'll talk about when we need to review the risk assessment and why we need to review the risk assessment. Quite often, um, the events that we hold are only one off events, but it may be that we have something that uh, occurs on a regular basis. For example, our local society, we open the observatory up for uh, public open nights. Um, 
every every month or we were doing prior to the lockdown so we do the risk assessment for the first event but then we think well maybe things didn't go as well as they as, as they could have done maybe things changed and we might need to get the risk assessment and just have another look at it and just review it so we talked about hazards what's the definition of a hazard quite simple it's anything with the potential to cause harm simple as that um, so thinking about a, an, a, a typical fairly uh, general astro astronomical event this is obviously before the uh, we were in the situation that we're in now so let's just look at this sort of common hazards that are likely to occur at any event obviously we've got things like slips and trips um, slips and trips can occur for all kinds of reasons obviously um, when we do tend to hold astronomy astronomy events nine times out of ten it tends to be dark we obviously like clear skies clear skies mean frost Frost obviously means frosty surfaces. So we've got slippery surfaces due to ice, that kind of thing. Quite often we'll hold them all out in the open, um, obviously on uneven ground. Um, fundamentally, it's gonna be held in the dark. We want to sort of be in dark conditions, dark skies, dark ground conditions. So it's gonna increase the risk of slipping and tripping. So there's gonna be lots of potential slips and trips out there. If we're holding the event inside an observatory, a lot of observatories tend to be old, old stone steps and that kind of thing. Floor conditions are not always too good. And we've got things like trailing cables and that kind of thing for power supplies and for, you know, for telescopes and all kinds of things like that. So there's lots of potential for slips and trips. We've obviously got to drive to the event. We may need to set up parking facilities. So we've got the risk of pedestrian and vehicle collisions that needs to be managed. Certainly for the organisers of the event, we've got the handling and the setting up of equipment. As we know, equipment can be quite heavy, it can be quite bulky, it can be quite cumbersome. Um, and people tend to get carried away, they want to help, so you get all kinds of people of all ages wanting to lift things, wanting to carry things. And uh, we've just got to say, well, be sensible about it, don't lift more than you can, just be careful that somebody doesn't put the back out or anything like that. Obviously using equipment, now we've talked about obviously the specific issues around COVID and eye protection and that kind of thing. But obviously as astronomers, we all know the risks if we're daytime observing of the sun and that kind of thing. But what we've got to remember is that a lot of the people coming to our events have never looked through a telescope before, haven't got any kind of background knowledge of, ob of observing or anything like that. And the first thing they want to do is look through a telescope straight at the sun. So we've got to be aware, we've got to remember that not everybody's as knowledgeable as we are. I've mentioned a little bit about weather conditions and obviously that, that has a big difference. <laughs> obviously, uh, a lot of the, uh, the time when we're going to be out there observing, it's going to be cold. We know that we're used to spending long times out the doors observing. But again, uh, guests who come to our events maybe don't know that. People have to be told, look, it's going to be cold out there, wrap up warm, bring a warm drink, things like that. If we're holding a, an activity at, at, at a public venue, which nine times out of ten, ten we probably are, in a public park or something like that. We've got potential risks with uh, cyclists, dog walkers, other sporting activities. Uh, these are all going on at the same time as our events going on. So um, our visitors, our participants could be injured by other events, that kind of thing. So we need to be aware that, uh, you know, those kind of things are going on. Electrical equipment, if we are using any kind of electrical equipment or uh, we've got electrical supplies in maybe an observatory or something like that. Fundamentally, a lot of observatories are quite old. Um, a lot of the equipment in there could be quite old. If the equipment's maybe not tested as often as it should be, maybe the plugs are a little bit loose, maybe the wiring's not quite up to scratch. Quite often, because uh, a lot of our events are organised by volunteers, volunteers bring along their own equipment. Obviously, if it's a work situation, equipment has to be new and it has to be tested and it has to be in good condition. But when we're bringing in our own equipment, maybe it's not quite as safe as it should be. So we do need to just have a look and make sure that everything's safe there. Quite often, people might be tempted to offer hot drinks. So we've got hot liquids, we've got maybe hot water, we've got water boilers, we've got kettles, um, with the obvious risks of scalding and things like that. Um, it's always a question, should we put some kind of food preparation? Should we allow, uh, you know, should we um, put some refreshments on and things like that? Maybe a little bit of a, an opportunity to make a bit more income. But if we start preparing food and we start selling food and we're allowing people to consume food, does that then raise food hygiene issues and all kinds of things like that? So these are things I'm not suggesting that we can't do that, but we just need to think about it in our risk assessment. 
the one that's on everybody's mind at the moment, well, exposure to COVID-19. Now, uh, obviously, I'm not going to pretend to uh, to cover that in any great detail now because I think Peter's uh, previous presentation has pretty much covered that as, as, as far better than I could do. So I haven't not really got much to add to that. All I would say is all we can do at the moment, um, nobody's an expert in this. It's an ever-moving feast. Keep an eye on the government guidance, which is changing all the time. And all we can do is go along with the guidance that's, um, you know, that's kind of given to us by the experts in the field. And we've just got to follow that guidance. Finally, then, any others, any other hazards that we can think of? And that's the opportunity when we are carrying out the risk assessment, get a small group together, get the organising to committee together and just go around the table and say, right, can anybody think of anything else? What could possibly go wrong? And um, have a think about it. If it's significant, record it. If it isn't significant, well, talk about it and then maybe dismiss it. <clears throat> So going back to the different people who, who may be harmed, obviously I spoke about some astronomical hazards, looking at the sun and things like that. Now, obviously we're quite experienced. We know about that. We wouldn't look through, the, uh, through a telescope at the sun, but other people haven't got the same kind of experience, haven't got the same kind of knowledge as we do. So we've got to think about it, not from our own individual point of view, but we've got to think about, well, who are the kind of people who could be harmed? Well, we look at the different group categories. Certainly, this is the organisers and there's the volunteers. Um, I think I might have just turned my volume down there. Hopefully, everybody can still hear me. Um, the society we members and the visitors that were, uh, were going to be invited to the event, uh, people from our own society, maybe it's just a, 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 a regular meeting, it's a society meeting, a group meeting, or something like that. But then it could be a, a, an open event where there's going to be other users of the venue, there's going to be general public, there's going to be lots and lots of people. And again, quite high numbers are possibly going to be involved. So we need to think about the different groups of people who are going to be attending. But then we need to think about the actual individuals themselves. Hopefully, we're going to have a lot of young persons. We're going to uh, um, encourage young people to get involved in our um, in our hobby, in our interest, in our science, as it were. Uh, but young people maybe you know haven't got the life skills, maybe a little bit over enthusiastic, that kind of thing. Need to be shown, need to be supervised. So we need to be careful if we do have a lot of children present. On the other hand. Could be a lot of elderly people. Um, we've talked about elderly people not being familiar with things like the internet and things like that. Equally, maybe not familiar with astronomical equipment and things like that. Um, or again, maybe not quite as steady on the feet when we're talking about the slips and the trips and elements and the uneven ground. We've also got to consider people with specific needs. So people who have got mobility issues or people who are maybe, um, you know, um, not got visually impaired or maybe hearing impaired, anything like that, learning difficulties. So we need to, need to think if there's going to be anybody like that attending the event. Maybe they're going to need more direct supervision. Maybe they're going to need somebody to just kind of, uh, you know, help that person along and that kind of thing. And all that needs to be considered in our risk assessment. <laughs> OK, so that's the background to the assessment. Um, so actually completing the assessment then. Well, we've looked at the hazards. We've looked at who can be harmed. We've looked at sort of uh, the likelihood and the, and the potential for it to happen. So now let's look at the existing controls. Well, we know that we've got slips and trips. We know that we've potentially got uneven floors and things like that. But what are we actually doing about it at the moment? Are there any uh, controls already in place? Like, for example, if we have got sort of frosty conditions, have we got some rock salt down? If we've got, say, maybe some uneven, uneven steps in the observatory, is there a handrail? So if there are controls in place, then are the control measures adequate? Can more be done? Does more need to be done? Or can we say, well, no, we're doing enough. We just need to carry on as we are doing. So we maybe need to prepare an action plan. And if we feel that it's a low risk, it's basically something that, uh, yes, we've looked at it, we've considered it, but fundamentally, we don't think there's any particular issues there, then no further actions needed. Just monitor what we've already got in place. And then we might think, well, the risk is a little bit more significant. We need to put some documented controls in place and we need to make sure that the activity is very closely supervised. So, again, if we are thinking about, say, COVID as an example, we know that we need to keep people distance two metres as a minimum. So we maybe need to get some uh, marshals in place. We maybe need to get some markings on the floor and that kind of thing and just make sure that we do put some documented controls together. 
If, on the other hand, we feel that it's a high risk, so again, things like looking at the sun through a telescope, or we need to make sure, sure nobody does that, so we need to get some further specific actions in place before the activity is permitted to com commence. And we might say, well, uh, before we set the telescopes up, we need to make sure that uh, you know members of the public are kept away, that there's an experienced person there to supervise activities, and things like that. Okay, so that's the background to the risk assessment. Now, we need to put pen to paper and we need to record it. Now, the thing to remember on this is that there's no set format. Um, there are many, many, many different risk assessments. And if you lock people like yourself in a room for a couple of hours and get them to argue amongst themselves, they'll all be convinced that their risk assessment format is the best of them all. But it doesn't really matter. Um, so long as it's something that works for your organization, something that's simple, something that everybody can understand, then that's fine. But there are certain things which should be recorded, and these are as follows. So first of all, details of the event and the venue. So we don't just really want a general risk assessment that could apply to any particular astronomy, astronomical event. We want it to apply to a particular event. So uh, when the event's occurring and where it's occurring. The date and the time that we actually did the assessment. We may have done the assessment in the park in the middle of summer on a glorious summer morning, but we're going to be holding an astronomical event in the middle of winter at midnight, so it's going to be completely different. We need to think about the actual location where we're holding the activity, the actual activities that are going to be carried out, the equipment involved and um, those kind of things. We need to record the hazards, so as I've said, who might be harmed and how. We then need to look at the details of the existing control measures. We then need to think about, well, what's the estimated risk? And as I mentioned earlier, um, how likely is it that the harmful event's going to occur? And if it did so, how, like, how harmful are the consequences going to be? How bad is it going to be? Now, there's lots and lots of ways of doing that. You'll see some people use numbers on the likelihood side and numbers on the consequence side, and they tie the two together and you come up with some kind of scoring. The most common one is probably one to five on the likelihood, one to five on the consequence, times the two together and you get anything from one to 25. That's a little bit complicated for our uh, purposes. Maybe we just use low, medium and high or something like that. Again, it's whatever suits the situation, but the main thing is keep it simple and something that everybody understands. Some people like to use colours. So if it's perfectly safe, we use green. If it's um, fairly minor risk, but somewhere in the middle, we use amber, a bit like with traffic lights. And if it's high risk, we need to do something about it before proceeding. Then we colour it red. That's quite good. That's quite visual. And again, that's quite a common method. But like I say, uh, the actual uh, way that we do record the estimation of the risk doesn't really matter. What we might need to do, though, is identify some additional risk controls that need to be put in place. Not always. I mean, it may well be that everything's OK as it was and we're just recording the fact that yet yeah, the event can go ahead without any further controls. But fundamentally, generally speaking, we need to make sure we've got some uh, risk controls that we need to follow. It's also important that we need to sort of record the details of the person or the people who carried out the risk assessment. Somebody at the end of the day has got to accept the findings and say, yeah, I'm happy with that risk assessment and fundamentally I'm happy for the event to go ahead. And really, we've got to say, well, that's the person who's responsible for, your, for organising the event. Um, so the head of the organising committee, um, the chairman of the Astronomy, Astronomical, Astronomical Society, um, whoever's ultimately responsible really um, but somebody's got to make the decision well do I accept the findings of the risk assessment and that's the person who actually signs off the risk assessments at the end. Finally um, we do need to think about reviewing the risk assessment so when would we review a risk assessment well once the additional controls have been implemented, hopefully that's going to reduce the risk even further. So what we might do is do an initial risk assessment a few days prior to the event put the additional risk controls in place that we identified initially, and then look at the risk assessment again. And hopefully the risks will actually have come down. And then we've got the final risk assessment. And that's fine, then we can go ahead with the event. But what if the circumstances change? We might have to review the assessment maybe, um, maybe mid-event, maybe more uh, visitors turn up than we expected if it's an open event. Maybe we only expected about 20, but about 40 or 50 have turned up. Does that make a difference? It certainly could do, particularly if it's an indoor event in a fairly tight space. 
the weather conditions well um, what are the weather conditions going to be like the weather conditions could change mid-event uh, it could start to snow or anything like that what we're going to do if the weather turns inclement and then any other reasons why we may review it like i say it's always a good idea at the end of the event to maybe think well what went well what went um, what went badly um, and um, what can we learn from it really at the end of the day the risk assessment is very much um, you know a learning process um, so that's really the end of the um, the, 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 the presentation um, a couple of um, questions that quite often I get asked um, first of all um, how detailed do I need to go into when carrying out a risk assessment that's quite often a concern for people how far do we need to go well, quite often when I'm carrying out risk assessment training for people and I might put a slide up on the screen or I might give them a scenario and I might say, well, spot some hazards, write down some hazards. And you'll notice that the people in the group right at the start, they start scribbling away, filling the paper with hazards. And then all of a sudden the pens will start to slow down. People will start to stop and think. And then they'll start to think, well, is it or isn't it? Once you get to that stage where people are starting to slow down and really think about it, well, is it a hazard? Is that really a hazard or isn't it? That's kind of really where the risk assessment's reached its kind of, if you like, um, stage of where it's suitable and sufficient. And we've probably got 90% of the potential hazards out there. So if you were sort of carrying out a risk assessment for an event and you did say, uh, like I've just suggested, maybe to the organising committee, right, think about some hazards that could occur with this event. Once people's thought process starts, starts to slow down, and once people start to really have to think about it, then you've probably gone as far as you need to do, at least in the initial assessment. The second question that people are often quite scared of, really, or quite often ask, well, what if I get it wrong? What if something happens and they haven't spotted it? Well, the simple answer is, is that none of us are perfect. Um, we are going to miss things. Everybody misses things. You only need to look at sort of international events that happen, sort of calamities and disasters and accidents and things like that, which even the experts quite enough can't often predict. So we're not going to fi actually find every single hazard that's out there. So really think about if you didn't do a risk assessment, you wouldn't spot half as many hazards as if you did. So think about the risk assessment, think about the hazards that you've actually identified, not the ones that you've missed. And that's really, you know, the whole purpose of the exercise to try to identify the obvious hazards out there. And that really um, reaches the end of the presentation. So hopefully that's been useful for everybody. And um, if anybody has got any questions or wants any further advice, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, I think we've got time for one specific question directed to you. And then what I suggest is that we go into about 10 minutes of Q&A and we'll shorten the break for uh, to, to, to five minutes or so with a, a restart at uh, three o'clock. Um, yeah. So Martin, do you have a question you want to, to pass on to, uh, on to Ian? Yeah, there's, there's one actually that sort of springs out. Um, not sure who it's from, but uh, can we effectively display or deploy generic risk, risk waiver notices to the public and members, e.g. attendance of this event is at your own risk, no liability for accident or injury is accepted by this society or its officials. Simple answer is no, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's tempting to. Um, obviously, um, there are certain risks that are beyond our control. Um, I'm thinking about things like weather conditions and things like that. We can't really control the weather, but um, we're actually putting an event on. We're inviting people to come to our event. We do have a duty to look after people. We might put the notice up and it might make us feel a little bit better, but it certainly wouldn't stop the, you know, the potential actions after the event. So I would be very, very loath to put the notices up. So <laughs> um, my advice would be no. I've got a very quick question for you, Ian. Um, in regard to COVID, uh, am I right in thinking that in general, people are not going to be covered by insurance on COVID, uh, but, but also that there are very likely to be very few problems or litigations allowed uh, in respect to risks due to COVID? Well, it's, it, yeah, it's very tricky at the moment. And not at the moment. I mean, obviously, it's early days for the insurance. I mean, for any insurance claim, basically, we've got up to sort of three years for the claimant to pursue a claim. 
Um, but certainly what is happening, certainly from a legal point of view, the health and safety executive and the local authorities and indeed the police are very, very actively prosecuting for breaches of COVID. Um, at the moment, we obviously can't put events on, so events are fundamentally out of the question anyway. Um, but certainly things like work activities, workplaces, and as we as we know, sort of, you know, public entertainment venues and things like that, if we don't follow the um, precautions for COVID, then we do run the risk of prosecution. And what you do tend to find is that um, where we've got criminal breaches, you know, breaches of things like health and safety law, then the civil side of it, the insurance side of it, seems to follow on fairly quickly. So I would say that ultimately, potentially, there could be insurance claims for breaches of COVID. Yes, but when we start to do uh, outreach again, when, when societies have done the risk assessment and deem that it's safe to return to doing it, and obviously from the government point of view, they remove and relax the restrictions to allow us to do it again. Um, presumably, if someone in good faith puts on an event and has taken all the precautions and then someone later on gets COVID, I mean, there is a good argument that of course, you can't prove that they got mm. COVID from your event. Yeah. Um, and also, you've done all of the, taken all the necessary precautions. They have to accept a certain degree of liability by simply attending an event with other people. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. It's fair I mean, to say that you could not bring successfully a claim against someone for catching COVID at an event by the time that the virus has abated. It would be very difficult, like you say, to prove that the, uh, you know, that the person actually did contract the virus at the event. It would be almost impossible. And again, all we can do, as long as um, when we do get hopefully back to whatever normal will mean, we do follow the latest guidance out there. All we can do is follow the guidance. It's a bit like, I mean, the other passion that I've got is obviously long distance running. I do a lot of athletics coaching and it's been a debate just recently, can we still continue to do one-to-one -one coaching? So the answer is yes, you can, but England Athletics have produced quite detailed guidelines as to how we do that. So as long as you follow the guidelines that are out there, that's all we can do. All I would say is, you know, we keep very up to date because it's very much a moving feast. The government do issue, you know, fairly up to date guidelines and all we can do is, is follow them. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. If we, um, if we go back into um, panellist mode here for the people, for the speakers from the first, uh, first half, Martin, do you want to run through some of the questions that, um, that we have from the, from the earlier on that we couldn't get answered? And if we carry on until about five to, uh, five, to five, then we'll have a, a five minute comfort break. Great. Oh, okay. okay. Great. <laughs> Um, right, let's see what we've got. Um, okay, there's Hoss. Uh, I think this is just really a comment, but um, Andrew's saying geography is effectively removed as a membership issue. My attendees are more interested in what I'm offering than how much effort is required to physically visit me. I guess something for your multi-site organisations, um, which, which I guess as a general comment is absolutely right, yes. Um, yeah, we've got members now in um, Switzerland and Spain who kind of flip between the two, who otherwise wouldn't be involved. <laughs> right, yeah. One point I've made to quite a few societies, of course, is that COVID is terrible, of course, but one of the silver linings that comes from Zoom is that societies can now, they have a window of opportunity to get speakers from overseas. So you can contact American speakers and European speakers and so on. And indeed, I, I believe we have several attendees at this webinar today um, from, from overseas, uh, from Finland, from Spain, from Portugal, from the USA and the Philippines. So um, it's certainly possible for you to get speakers to your events that you wouldn't normally be able to afford to uh, to bring along. Yeah, we had um, we got to see Mars during uh, NAW because we had an astronomer observing from Cyprus, so it totally saved us. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have clear skies. Oh dear. Um, right, another as another comment. Zoom is more intuitive um, than most other platforms, and public can be easily coached on how to use it. Um, so that's good. 
Uh, Graham asks, it would be very useful to have a link uh, to info re disinfecting eyepieces. I think we could probably put all of the necessary links and things up onto yeah. the, on yeah. the FA's website. And um, I, I did also, uh, in the chat, I asked if uh, maybe speakers could make available uh, their presentations to go on the website as well. Uh, we have uh, one of the uh, attendees today who is blind, and that means that he can then review the, the slides themselves directly using his, uh, his uh, software. Right, yes, that, co that comment came up a couple of times uh, about the eyepieces. Um, right, uh, Stuart said he, he was returning from Singapore over a year ago um, and caught conjunctivitis um, six hours after landing. Uh, his, his optician described it as the worst case of conjunctivitis, uh, conjunctivitis that he had seen. <clears throat> and now look at it being a case of COVID conjunctive, which is interesting. Um, <clears throat> would because they, they, they are as I say three percent of patients <clears throat> are either presenting or get conjunctivitis with COVID so if you get to, I think now it's right down the bottom of the list obviously of uh, presenting symptoms but if they are testing people who present with conjunctivitis just in case it is COVID conjunctivitis sure yeah uh, would Dr. Peter James recommend that societies plan to hold all talk meetings online for the rest of 2021? I think I wouldn't be surprised if well into the um, uh, past summer, we would that may be true. I mean, until you've got, even when you have 80% of the population vaccinated, you still have 20% who aren't. And uh, we still don't really know whether one vaccination, which is what's going to start here, what it is starting here, will prevent the disease actually being spread on, whether the person, it's likely that one vaccination will stop you spreading it, but we can't be sure until the, until the studies have done. So I think we're not looking any sort of normality one-to-one -one until the autumn, which astronomically is not the end of the world. I mean, you know, if we get, we, if we could get back in September, October, that would be good. But uh, I think we can't make any presumptions about what's happening this year at all. And I think all these, the virtual and online um, uh, efforts are the best way to look forward at the moment. Anything else is a bonus. Okay, thank you, Peter. I think we need to, to, to draw a quick close and to the, to the question and session, session here. We've got uh, another longer question answer session at the end of the, the day. And obviously we can run on a little longer then if we need to as well. So um, I'll just put up um, just, a, just a rolling presentation for the next uh, few minutes. And we aim to be back here and start at, uh, at three o'clock. Graham is our FAS president, vice president, and um, Graham is going to talk to us about doing outreach indoors under circumstances that you can, uh, as a society or as an organizer, uh, control yourself. It's your own premises, perhaps, or maybe you're doing it outdoors. Uh, uh, it's in a place where, where you've got direct control over how, how you organize risks. OK, thank you, Graham. Thank you very much. Right, so let's um, slide show. So uh, can I just have a thumbs up, Paul, that you can see that? Thank you very much. OK, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, 
the starting of this after the latter part of the afternoon session talking about the experience what we've had is a, a lot of uh, information giving in the first four sessions uh, so what i want to talk about is um, the experience of making a society clubhouse observatory or other facility COVID secure. Now, this is based on the experience we had in the latter part of last year when um, theatres, schools, colleges and universities were able to go back. And so we took some opportunities. And so this is the experience there. Now, we have uh, uh, some examples here of a society owned observatory or club room, uh, maybe a society planetarium uh, and others there, and uh, maybe just a, a club meeting room. Now, I having a look around with the FAS members, I can see that many of the uh, astronomical societies that belong to the FAS do have uh, some significant facilities, uh, observatories, meeting rooms, and uh, you can see in the center there, uh, this is the Norman Lockyer Observatory there, they have a planetarium as well. So there are, are many around there, lots and lots of facilities. So that needs to be um, managed. So again, general kind of uh, COVID, uh, COVID, COVID precautions, I'm not going to say any more, but a lot of what you do is then based on government advice, hand, space and face. Uh, that's uh, really very important there. So I think when you're then starting to uh, look at these uh, facilities, you have to kind of consider who is going to be using this. Is this going to be just a member or two? Or, or three. Um, you can have a group of members using this facility. Uh, are you going to have members of the public or is it going to be a, um, a Cub Scout group coming up and so on and so forth. So you need to look at that. And in fact, when um, we did this last year, uh, that's indeed what happened. It's useful to start on a small scale. This has been a message that's uh, come out um, throughout the day is start small and then work into a more um, perhaps a significant uh, number of people if you feel it's uh, safe to do so. So what you have to do is to try and make your facility what the government call is COVID secure. So this is very important there. So um, in order to do this, um, I'm going to give some examples of what I did with uh, a couple of organizations that I was involved with. So uh, we did risk assessment on each occasion, uh, which included not only the general risk assessment, but the COVID risk assessment there. And I think it's really important that if you're going to do this, you do some research. Uh, some of that research has been available for you from today, but I think it's very important uh, to perhaps go on the government website if you start looking at uh, working safely. There are many, many documents published on the government website. And when you look at these, what you realize is uh, that there's some general principles behind there. Again, hands, space, uh, face, and so on. That set is the theme that runs through all these type of documents. And there are others. I've just happened to be picking out a few there as uh, to give you an example. Uh, but it's important, I think, to, to read through those, which is, in fact, what we did um, last year when we were looking at this. And so we, there was nothing that was going to come out that was going to be surprising. Now, when we're working with the, um, the planetarium, the South Downs Planetarium, one of the things we looked at was the uh, guidance and advice for theatres, because you had a lot of people in there. So those are the kind of things that uh, was quite useful to do uh, and, and important in that respect. So Ian's talked about uh, risk assessment. You can see here I've got two risk assessments, one for the Clanfield Observatory, which is what I will talk about. And I've used a combination there of what Ian was saying is colouring them and using the uh, severity and the possibility there, the probability and scoring that. And so that was quite clear. And in fact, that is one that's been used with the planetarium as well. And then from that, so we had the COVID action plan. And you can see there's an, the, the beginnings of that on the left hand side of the screen uh, where we start to um, uh, break down some of the things that we need to do and making sure that we've got the action required, any equipment, who's going to do it and by when. And so this is version 1.5. So this is just September's one. There will be another one soon when we uh, open up um, after this current lockdown. So that's very important to do that on a regular basis. Make sure it is um, uh, certainly topical. 
So that's uh, really important there. And as has already been said, sharing this with everybody who's going to be involved and sharing the results with uh, the people who've got to make it work. That's uh, really quite important. Now, as has been said, uh, some money has been spent on the um, IT side of things in making that uh, work. So these are some of the things of which we've done in order to make the observatory COVID secure. So uh, making sure that people were able to uh, clean their hands with a sanitizer, although we do have hand washing facilities there. That was important. Taking a temperature of people. Now, you can get different thermometers. Um, I must say that the cheaper ones you get tend to be less reliable. Um, the ones I've seen, about 50 pounds, tend to be pretty reliable. And then you take the temperature of everybody who's coming on site. As um, Dr. James has uh, mentioned about fresh air and ventilation, very, very important there. And so in order to make the observatory room there uh, COVID secure, uh, we installed a, 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 an air ventilator. Now, this is pushing about 150 cubic a thousand cubic litres of air per hour into the building and then with the windows open it blows that out otherwise you're leaving doors open and things like that and this is a little mechanism that heats the air as it comes in as well which is quite useful face masks covering and things you know everybody who comes in uh, to the observatory there must wear their uh, covering uh, face coverings so in order to make the observatory secure what we were saying is uh, you have to be uh, washing your hands uh, using the gel we'd have your temperature taken we have forced air ventilation in the building there in the observatories themselves we're not too worried about that because if you've got an observatory you know just how drafty they are anyway so that that's fine especially with the shutters open and uh, from a personal perspective their face masks and things and uh, we registered the observatory and in fact we did the same with the planetarium and so you get a qr code and people can uh, uh, click into that. Now that's the things of which um, the organization was doing in order to make this COVID secure but what we also said is that personal behavior was important as well. So we were saying that nobody can attend the observatory or indeed the planetarium if they're feeling unwell in any way shape or form. As we've already heard it's been difficult to kind of determine whether you have COVID your symptoms might be somewhat spurious which could then later turn out to be COVID. So any illness of any sort generally means you don't attend. Um, if you have COVID symptoms, obviously, we don't want people to be around there. If we, anyone was waiting for a COVID result, we were saying you must not attend either. And um, if anybody in the family has got COVID currently, then you don't attend. And uh, obviously, if you've had a positive COVID result uh, or if you are isolating, you don't attend. So there are two prongs to this. One is the physical measures that we can put in and the other is the behavioural <clears throat> measures which we expected from individuals during that time. Now, when we then started to look at the observatory buildings themselves, um, in each building we made available some facilities there. So we just put a bucket there where everything was included. So you've got some uh, antiviral surface cleaner, some PPE, some tissues and things like that. And so what people were expected to then do is to wipe down anything that they had touched at that time. So that was very important. And each of the observatories has a shut down procedure. So this is based on what people basically um, touch when they are using that observatory. So the shutters, the, um, the ro dome rotations, uh, the telescope and things. So there are some frequent touch points and they are to be wiped down and we provide all the facilities that uh, an individual observer would need in wiping that down. And um, for the club room, as uh, has been mentioned already, uh, the soft furnishings are more difficult to clean down in the same way that you can do a hard surface. So we used a long acting um, product. Uh, we bought Bacaban, and, and as Dr. James has said there, that um, this is one that's used in the aviation industry. They spray out the inside of an aircraft every 10 days, and then they don't have to keep cleaning it down after every flight. So this 
this is used uh, on a weekly basis in the club room there to spray curtains, furnishings, carpets and, and um, soft chairs and so on. Um, that's a picture of yours truly. I bought some PPE just to spray it. I don't know how toxic this stuff is. I suspect it's not too bad, um, but I wasn't going to take any chances. And so I sprayed that around. And uh, that little bottle there is one litre. It was costing about £130. Uh, it does get diluted, so it will last a long time. And you can buy smaller quantities, but uh, once it's mixed, it doesn't have a very long shelf life. But the concentrate, as you can see in this one, does last much, much longer. OK, so that's what we were doing in order to try and make the observatory and the club room there COVID secure. Now, in terms of uh, the use of that building, early on, the, uh, the, the observatory was saying that this could only be used for signing in and taking equipment out to the observatories. Later on, as time uh, progressed and the government relaxed uh, the situation, then we had a small group of people meeting there for an astronomy course. They, they were all distanced in the chairs and so on. And again, wearing face masks and so on and so forth. So that's what we're able to do. So I'm not going to go through this in any great detail. It's just to say that there was a process that was taken in order to open up and that everybody agreed with the, from a committee point of view. Um, so uh, members being made aware that this observatory was going to be open, the purchasing of PPE products and cleaning equipment and so on. Uh, we have a group of trainers on each of the observatories. The particular observatory I'm involved has got five domes and so each one has got a team of trainers and they went in cleaned the observatory after it being locked down for several months uh, and then uh, we were able to draw up a cleaning schedule after each use and um, uh, that was then published and uh, we took every single member who wishes to use that observatory through not only just a refresher on how to use the observatory um, and the equipment there but also the COVID cleaning uh, that was important and then they had to prove that they were uh, comfortable at using that and uh, uh, and uh, being able to close down. So each observatory is different. Every, uh, so what we did is how the telescope and the observatory is used. You can see here, this is uh, just a quick um, um, copy from one of the uh, shutdown procedures in the domes, but it's just, I mean, you don't have to necessarily read it there, uh, but you can see that, you know, the telescope caps, focusing bits, the focusing wheels, the drive engagement, you know, the stuff that gets touched an awful lot um, uh, it's going to be wiped down. So this is an aid memoir so that they're going to use the cleaning station, take that blue uh, tissue uh, and uh, with the uh, antiviral just wipe things down uh, and then uh, that's it. And then they, what we say to every member is you take that tissue away with you, uh, bring a a plastic bag of some sort and take it home for disposal. Don't leave it around in the observatory for others to have to clean up after you. So that's what we were doing. So um, we managed to open up the observatory for several months, the latter part of last year, and that seemed to be working very, uh, very well. You do have to, my experience is that you do have sometimes have to keep an eye on some of the members. Um, some people get absolutely focused on doing their astronomy and uh, the uh, maybe not wearing their masks when they should do. And a gentle reminder from time to time uh, is uh, maybe necessary or just, uh, just to go through the uh, COVID cleaning again. So what I'm pleased to say is that uh, as a result of that, no person using the observatory or involved in that uh, astronomy course uh, latter part of last year came back to us to say they caught COVID at all. So um, uh, I'm quite pleased about that secure nature. Now that was a, as an observatory. Now inside a building, well here we have uh, the, the work that was undertaken with the South Downs Planetarium. So this is if you like, it's like a theatre. And so uh, we uh, drew heavily on the guidance that was published by the um, 
uh, the government in uh, in that sort of uh, scenario and so the distancing people flow how people walk around the building and you can see some examples of how we did that and so uh, we needed to make sure that um, uh, people are distanced and so on again temperature is taken of everybody who walks in and sanitizing is available to everybody and they are expected to use it and one of the things that we were saying is that because um, the government advice is not everybody has to wear face masks and so what we were saying in the end is if you are someone who doesn't uh, have to wear a face mask what we ask is that they wear a face shield and we had some available uh, to give them if that was necessary at that particular time and it's useful to actually physically walk around the building to see how people are going to use that at any one time um, if you're holding a meeting, uh, again, I'm drawing on Ian's excellent work that he did at Preston and District Astronomical Society, uh, points to consider when holding a meeting. I've lifted uh, information from that. I'm a great believer of not having to reinvent the wheel and the work that they did at holding a meeting is absolutely uh, superb. It really is well done. And um, I would um, commend that to anyone listening to contact uh, the Preston and District District. In fact, I have been passing that out to a number of astronomical societies who have been asking for it. Now, it's quite useful. We talked about use of social media, and I think if you are having open evenings, um, public observing outreach, it might be useful to put something up on a YouTube as to how you are managing your precautions, what you're expecting of individuals when they come to you. You can link this to your websites, I'm sure, and it just gives people an expectation of you, of you and your expectation of the public when they come along, like face masks, uh, distancing and so on and so forth. The other thing to bear in mind is that it's sometimes very useful to get feedback on what you're doing. And so this is some that was taken from the South Downs Planetarium website where you got the TripAdvisor feedback. And I've just uh, uh, lifted that one there. Wonderful surprise, been, never been there. It carries on um, how well it was all prepared and um, executed. And importantly, the COVID safe protocols were second to none and made to feel safe and comfortable comfortable and uh, so highly recommended. So that is, uh, I think, a good testament uh, to what it is you're doing. Now, one of the things I'm going to say finally is be careful where you get your information. We've heard already that lots of youngsters uh, don't like to go on to kind of the official websites. They get a lot of their information from social media and there is a lot of rubbish uh, there on social media. So um, I'm just putting this up uh, because we've all heard about um, the vaccines and, and so on and being traced. So, um, you know, be careful where you get your information from. Um, go to official websites. That's really very important. Um, the government, um, you know, follow the science is what I'm saying. So if you've got members who are very much into social media um, and they come up with something rather spurious, I remember right at the very beginning of the outbreak, people were saying, drink tepid water Graham uh, and uh, they were um, sharing this around and I said this is a complete and utter rubbish ignore it I don't know where you're getting that from and so on but there we are so thank you very much um, and stay safe so uh, that's the end of my little uh, uh, my bit there so thank you many thanks Graham um, Martin do you want to work through uh, a couple of questions for Graham Okay, yes. Um, I suppose this could be for Graham or um, Dr. James. Is the temperature gun useful? What, what would be an okay temperature range and what to do if they exceed it? Might they not just have been walking quickly? Yes. For instance. Okay. Well, uh, before uh, Dr. Peter James uh, uh, gives you the definitive answer, I'll tell you what we're doing. Is what we're saying <laughs> is that if your temperature is below 38, you're okay. Yes, of course, if people are wrapped up and they're going to come and have a bit of a high temperature, you can redo it. Um, but generally speaking, um, you know, if they get a high temperature, it remains high. Go home. That's what I would say. But in terms of uh, cooking viruses and uh, infections, I'll defer to uh, Dr. Peter James there. You'll have to unmute yourself. The, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. The, um, the, uh, the, the temperature guns, which is what that was, 
are very effective at uh, getting a very good idea of the body temperature, even if you've come in. So after you probably come in from a cold night and uh, so your temperature will be will be pretty accurate that and you always have the option of putting them aside and just checking in a few minutes. So yeah. if you have a temperature, I would say you probably, you know, a significant temperature, you probably ought not to be admitted just to be on the safe side. Yes. And sometimes the forehead is a bit cold when they've come in. I've sometimes done it on wrists and then checked head and things like this. So there's other ways of, of doing that. That's, that's quite useful. But um, yeah. OK, uh, just another quick one, um, actually from John Axtor. Graham, did your attendees each bring their own eyepieces to the observing session um, at the various domes? He certainly would not want to have sanitizer poured anywhere near his ethos. <laughs> yes. Uh, OK. Um, what I've done is a lot of people are wearing glasses, so uh, they're not getting that close to the eyepiece. Um, so what we have done is to um, wipe the eyepiece round uh, because there's a, a rubber cup. So I do use the antiviral wipe the rubber ring round uh, and let that stand for a moment to dry off and then the next person uses it. Mm -hmm. um, it is a concern, I am worried about that, um, but at the moment um, we haven't had any problems, but being very careful with eyepieces. Yes, I uh, and uh, jo uh, John is correct, you don't want to be, you know, dipping them into vats of um, antiviral that won't do the eyepieces any good. Mm. But just being sensible with that. Just as a, uh, the, the Glasgow people use 70% ethanol but wipes they don't spray which would wouldn't be good for them for the kit but they use uh, um, a little swab with 70 percent um, ethanol wiped around the eyepiece and around the, the rubber cups and then if you just leave it for a minute or two the ethanol would have evaporated because you don't want to put ethanol on your eyeball either so, so you just need to but they seem that they seem very happy with it they're the microscopes cleaning yep. it away. okay uh, thank you very much, uh, Graham and, and Peter. Um, maybe we move on now to, uh, to Charles. And Charles is going to talk about uh, doing outreach indoors, but where you are doing outreach maybe for somebody else or in premises that you don't have direct control of. So if you're a society going to a school, for example. Thank you, Charles. Okay, th thank you, Paul. Um, hopefully uh, everyone can hear me and uh, hopefully uh, can now see the uh, slide, Paul, can you see the slide? Just uh, a good check. Yes, I can. Yes, yeah, yes. Uh, great. Okay, well, I mean, fantastic. Thank you, Graham, for your presentation, because of course it covers a lot of what I'm doing, uh, except from the other side. And uh, I, although I run, uh, here's the observatory, just to get another picture of the observatory, I am doing that on the grounds of Marlborough College, uh, a school uh, in Wiltshire, um, and I'm also involved in outreach at uh, Oxford University, and I go into other schools and other schools come to me, uh, though obviously not at, at the moment, and we are talking about this in an environment where uh, e even before lockdown uh, and schools in different tiers, all schools will have different rules and one needs to be very aware of that. And it may well be some time uh, before we can actually get into schools at all. Uh, just as a uh, interest um, on working on the school, the college campus here, I've actually been unable to have any visitors at all at the observatory since March. Uh, and those are the school rules. And those are the ones that you would have to uh, pertain to. Um, I am able with permission to use the observatory uh, for sole use uh, when I'm there on on my own. So um, what you need to do is to uh, adhere to the risk assessment, which should be done by the host. Um, again, the talk earlier was ideal as to what sort of things the host should do. Uh, the host risk assessment should cover a general risk assessment for the uh, venue. Um, and then, of course, now uh, a COVID-19 specific risk assessment uh, for the venue or the event uh, and the group. Um, and really what you should do is to uh, ask for that, uh, to see that in advance and to improve upon the host venue's rules, uh, taking into account the sort of activities you would do. Again, I would say this is all presuming that uh, you are actually going to uh, be going there uh, and that may not happen for some time. But let's hope at some stage this will become possible uh, and you will be able to get to a, um, a host venue. 
Uh, so uh, the venue uh, must have, and these have all been covered, obviously the venue must have and uh, provide alcohols-based sanitizers for hands or uh, having listened to uh, Dr. James, uh, make sure that all the attendees have washed their hands with soap and water. Um, but it must also have very clear signage, uh, re-social distancing and the enforcement of masks and they should have spares there or turn away people without masks. Um, I, on, in my knowledge, in most sites I've been uh, aware of, um, then masks are uh, worn everywhere inside. Uh, in some centres, they're only worn in areas where people pass each other, i.e. in corridors, uh, but in many indoor areas, uh, their mask wearing is, uh, is essential. And obviously, I so would suggest that you would bring your own mask uh, in, to comply with that, but of course, as a speaker, uh, you're more likely to uh, have a visor. So, just an example of the sort of signs that you'll, you'll get for the sanitizing, social distancing, but all venues will have their own social distancing rules as well. Uh, the key is two meters must be always preserved, at least between you and them, uh, because you must realize that when you go, go to a venue, uh, it's really you that are the risk. They are managing their own risks uh, with all their own rules for the people in the center, whether it's a school or a college or any other kind of club, uh, but you are uh, potentially a risk coming in from outside. So you must maintain uh, a distance, obviously from your benefit as well, but each host may have different rules. Um, for example, schools may be operating uh, groups within different bubbles. And if you have a, a bubble uh, that has already been tested and are all clear, uh, they may operate at lower than two meter distancing. Uh, otherwise, of course, two meters can make an enormous difference to the number of uh, people you can get into any one, any one venue. Uh, so they may be able to sit closer and don't worry about that. That'll be something decided upon by the host. But I would suggest you have your own mask and most specifically, you have your own visor. Uh, it should be your own. You, you be careful of its uh, uh, handling, etc. And using a visor, uh, people can then see you. Uh, we often have in, in all sorts of venues, people who have uh, hearing impairments and it's very important that people should be able to lip read. Uh, so a visor and not a mask is I think essential. Uh, one of the key things will be number control. Uh, many of the venues will have uh, severe limitations uh, depending on their social distancing in numbers and the venue should then restrict the numbers either by issuing separate invitations to different groups or perhaps actually allocating uh, different groups into, uh, in, into the different bubbles perhaps that they're, they're using. Um, in terms of social distancing, as I said, uh, I think that's probably the most important one and you need to consider the venue. And uh, like all these things, uh, corresponding uh, and talking to the venue and going there early, uh, having a walk around the venue and seeing the lie of the land should enable you to allocate yourself a place to speak, for example, um, and organize how you're going to carry out the activity. Um, and I, again, I said that it, it's, it's the venue uh, should organize the, the seating uh, according, to their, according to their rules. Um, one of the things that's been mentioned before is traffic flow. This is uh, a venue responsibility. Uh, but it might be something that you might, given your activity, might have a need for people to go from A to B, uh, and therefore you need to liaise with them as to what that, uh, as to what that might, what that might be. Um, uh, the venue should organise entry and exit routes, uh, and for example, there should be clear signage uh, for uh, entry and one-way systems. You'd expect them to have clear systems clear systems in, in place for that. Uh, the venue should provide marshals uh, for the flow. Uh, it shouldn't really be up to you to have to organize. Uh, certainly children, uh, maybe students and maybe elder, elderly people, uh, th there should be someone there to control it for you uh, and uh, make, make sure that they are doing uh, what they should be, what they should be doing. Uh, it's also important that queues are avoided uh, where at all possible uh, and pinch points and there should be social distancing. And again, you really need monitors to help you depending on the number of people who are expected. Um, 
there could be a need for barriers, clear signage, um, and ideally um, a clear route that everyone should that everyone should follow. Um, cleaning uh, has already been uh, referred to several times. Um, the venue uh, organised should include should ensure the cleaning of the venue before and after, uh, and um, that that should be taken as taken as read. Um, the cleaning of equipment of high risk areas, uh, but I'm really talking about things like uh, doorknobs, uh, chairs, doors, stair rails, uh, etc., should be the venue's responsibility. But of course, if you are bringing uh, your own equipment or uh, own bits of uh, kit, uh, then you should uh, you should clean those yourself. Um, sort of cleaning kit being referred to already, so. You might well have a, a spray that you can spray over stuff, obviously not your expensive telescope eyepieces or the optics, um, uh, but sanitizer, uh, spare gloves, disposable gloves, uh, a cloth, uh, a mask, etc. And I would suggest that you actually carry around this uh, in the boot of your car or wherever you're going to a venue and have these things uh, available and on site uh, in case the uh, venue have organized them in a different different place and, and not so accessible. Uh, so um, I, I'm saving us time a little bit here because a lot of that has been has been overlap. Um, but I would say that you know my mess messages uh, go online and all Lucinda's suggestions at the beginning and and other good suggestions. Um, this I think is going to be the way forward for some time. Um, I have been, uh, I think, surprised, but perhaps it shouldn't have been really, at the huge increase in the number of people uh, certainly coming to my observatory uh, and you know going uh, and talking elsewhere would be the same. The number of people who can attend uh, compared to normal uh, is hugely more by uh, running something over Zoom or live streaming. And as has been said, people can attend from very far afield who don't need to travel. Um, wasn't mentioned earlier, but the elderly um, in the outreach groups that I'm involved with have uh, hugely enjoyed being able to sit in a warm uh, room at home and do observing late into the night. Um, that would apply also to young children uh, who otherwise won't be able to stay up after bedtime because of course a lot of these things can be recorded uh, the streams, etc. The YouTube clips can be recorded. So it is well, well worth getting going with full zooming, live streaming, YouTubes, and all the other things that have been suggested. And I would suggest that astronomy outreach may be uh, at the beginning of a completely new era in the amount of outreach that can be done. Um, so maybe a silver lining to this whole uh, pandemic uh, that this uh, has accelerated perhaps everyone actually getting up and learning how to do these sort of things. Of course, one doesn't want to say that it would replace in the long term getting cold and being out there with a funny hat and thick coat uh, and getting out to see the stars yourself, because I think so, there is so much for getting an eye to an eyepiece and actually seeing things with your own eye. And uh, we all know how much images can be manipulated online. Um, but I, uh, I think that go online is, is going to be the message, certainly for the next 12, 12 months. Um, and uh, that's the end of my end of my presentation. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions from from my perspective of both running an observatory and also being someone who operates within uh, a school environment within its own rules uh, and also talking to other venues that are uh, and people who go out to other venues or used to and are hoping to in the future. Thank you very much, Charles. I'm, I'm afraid I rather rudely omitted to introduce you properly at the beginning. Um, Charles is the, uh, the director of the Blackett Observatory at Marlborough College, and he's on the RAS's Education and Outreach Committee. And also, uh, some of you may remember, Charles gave a, a talk at um, one of the uh, AGM conventions we had uh, in York, and uh, he talked there a little bit about the International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics. And I, I urge you all, if you don't know anything about the uh, International Olympiad, to, uh, to go and check it up on the website. And I'm sure if you contacted, uh, contacted Charles at Marlborough College, he'd be able to let you know uh, how your uh, school can, can get involved. Thank you very much for that. Well, it's very, very useful to get out to the, uh, the societies here, um, that it is something sort of inspirational, I think, for, for any of your younger members to, uh, to set their minds to.
Thank you, Charles. Uh, now, question, uh, Martin. Uh, there's one, one that's come in from Steve. Um, you mentioned venues should be doing things. What if they don't? Walk away? <laughs> Um, I think this is where you have prior conversations. I think the idea of, you know, they, they book you in, you turn up on the evening and you find they haven't done it, is it going to put you in a really difficult position? Because, uh, I mean, essentially it's their responsibility, I think, but uh, you have to remember you are vulnerable. I mean, I'm well aware that, well, I know how the, how the statistics sort of work out, but I'm in a vulnerable group. I'm very well aware of who I expose myself to, as it were, in terms of the COVID uh, virus. And... Um, uh, so I think you check them in advance and you make sure they're going to do it. And, and yeah, can you can you know they've done it efficiently? No, you can't. And I think you just have to take out a red. But at the end of the day, if they have produced a risk assessment, if they said they've done these things, it's on paper. I think that's where it stops. Indeed. Okay. Another question, Martin? Thank you. Uh, I think that's it at the moment. OK, thank you very much, Charles. Um, so now we move on to um, a talk by uh, Jenny Shipway. Uh, Jenny is a freelance uh, outreach uh, presenter. Um, so Jenny is going to talk now about the other quarter of the cake, which is um, we're moving over to outdoors now. And this is outdoors for the case when you have control. So, for example, you're giving um, a, a, a outreach to the public in the middle of a field or something like that. You've got control over the over the arrangements. Thank you very much, Jenny. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. So hopefully you can all see that now. So this is a picture actually of Winchester Science Centre, which is where I was based for 10 years. And during that time, I ran a lot of public events and including astronomy events, working with a number of the regional astronomy societies around um, I'm having my weird intermittent problem with screen share. So if it looks all right to you, we're probably OK. But Paul, if you download my presentation just in case and have it ready to go, that would be good because it might freak out look. any moment. Yeah. So I'll be talking about when it's basically your site that you're running. And one of the things that I wanted to think to start with is just that there are different issues to be thinking of in terms of COVID in particular. And one of them is the difference between public health and personal health issues that you want to protect the specific members of the people who are present, but also thinking on a wider scale about the spread of virus across the population. So there's kind of different ways in which you can frame this. And although, yes, you need to follow all the government limits and to whenever it may be in the future that you're ready to start doing events, um, you need to look at the current recommendations from the government to remember also that these are limits and not recommendations. So it's like a speed limit. If all else is good, you can go ahead on that basis, but you do need to be thinking of yourself of the risks and what you're happy to accept as a risk as well. And part of that is going to be culturally what's acceptable as a risk, which is less of a scientific thing and more of a cultural thing. Um, and that may also change in the future, the, the appetite people have for this, um, in which case it's comparing your event to comparable events. So being as safe as a trip to the supermarket would not be an obvious comparison because going to the supermarket is an essential activity. But just all these different things, there are so many variables, it's very hard, you can't give any specific advice. So what I'm going to be doing is just whizzing through a whole load of issues of the sorts of things that you should be considering if you're running this type of event um, that you should be thinking about. And then at the end, I'll give you a couple of references to some really nice checklists as well that you could use when you're ready to be doing that. So can I move on to my next slide? So firstly, thinking about the site that you have. So I'm going to be talking about outdoor sites. Julie is going to be talking about indoor sites and there's a lot of overlap. So she's going to be talking more about the activities specific to astronomy and I'm going to be talking more about the general <laughs> organisation this. So although you're outdoors, outdoors obviously much less risk with COVID, you're going to have air movement which rapidly disperses any viral particles. It doesn't mean though that there's zero risk. So one of the things that thinking about outdoors is thinking about the weather 
So if you have still air, then you're going to have less movement all of all of this. If you have someone who is stood still on a still night, breathing constantly into the same patch, yes, it's not as bad as doing that indoors, but there's still going to be a potential issue. It's still something to think about. Um, also, whether in terms of rain, if it's tipping down with rain, you're probably going to cancel your event anyway. If it tipped down with rain yesterday, you might find you have areas of standing water, which affect the way that people move around the site. So you may need to then kind of recheck your risk assessment relating to that. And also being outdoors, thinking about the weather. So people behave differently in different weather. So if it's really cold and if they're not wrapped up warm enough, they're going to be different. They're going to want to seek warmth. If you have a toilet, it may be more popular if it's warm in there. Um, they may need a toilet more if it's cold as well. The human body does that. And just and they may have a lower dwell time on site. If it's lovely in a warm night, people might want to stay all evening. And then that comes with its own risks as well. Um, some things I was going to always through, if you're obviously you've got to think about the land use. Um, are you allowed to use this land? If it's public land, you do have to check the local authority is happy with you doing this and any local restrictions and working within that. And if it's private land, obviously the landowner needs to know what you're going to be doing. And that will include things like if people are driving up to the land, where they're going to be and the way people may be moving around the site. You don't want them busting through a hedge to take a shortcut to an interesting part of your event. Um, other things about the site, we're outdoors, so there's, I'm hoping there's loads of space and it's going to be a lot easier to socially distance because you're outdoors, you're not squeezed in small rooms. But also you have to think about things like if you had to suddenly evacuate the site, would everyone be running for the same small gate? <laughs> and if everyone is coming and going at the same time, are they all going to be squeezing down the same narrow path? So there can be certain positions and points at which even though you're, in general you have a lot of space in reality um, there are pinch points that you do need to consider still. Um, oh, one more weather one I forgot to mention as well with rain is if you have an unexpected rainstorm what will people do? Um, if there is any indoor space people might all run for that and crush into there. If there's like an obvious tree that gives shelter is everyone going to run under that tree and squash together? So again, these things that affect human behavior and people don't always behave. The public won't behave kind of following your risk assessment. Unfortunately, you have limited ability to kind of control them. So next, just thinking about who you've got running your event, your team. And you're gonna have a number of members involved in any public event. And especially, I think, in COVID times, you need to really plan exactly how they're going to work together and who has what responsibility. So one thing I'd recommend is to have someone who's designated as your COVID officer. So this is the person who, this is where the buck stops, kind of, if so I mean, it's their responsibility to make sure people are following these control measures, that everything is safe as, or as safe as you've agreed is acceptable. And also then they're the single point of contact for if anyone has any concerns about anything, that's the person who they go up to. They know the risk assessment backwards, they can make final decisions about safety. And also they can be collecting information and learning which can then go into updating your risk assessment and planning of future events as well. But having that one person means that if two things happen at different sides of your event, those two bits of information will end up in the same brain, which allows them then to make better decision making. Um, other staff, I'm going to I'll keep calling them staff automatically. I know they're not staff, but you know, um, you might want to consider having bubbles of um, your members so that if you have people working in different groups, maybe so that you're not having every single member working alongside every other member, just to reduce the amount of mixing that you're having. And some people, you might just want to say, no, you can't cut them. I mean, it may be that your risk assessment is such that this is not a safe activity for your 90-year-old unvaccinated member who has massive lung problems to be attending. And I think you need to 
have a point at which you decide things aren't safe and to be confident enough to say, no, that is not going to happen. Um, uh, like I said about the prior planning, think about there's a higher than normal possibility that people will drop out. They may be ill, but also they may just need to self-isolate. So you need to know who your essential personnel. At what point do you not have enough people to run this event anymore? Checking that you have people who can cover each other's um, responsibilities if necessary, thinking in advance of how you would manage that, making sure you have contingency of more members than you need. And by having all of that planned in advance, what you're doing also is making it a lot easier for people to drop out. So what you don't want, where, the, where all of this goes wrong is a cognitive bias called, I think it's plan completion bias. And what it is, is when people have this plan, I am going to run a stargazing event. And that becomes so overwhelming that they start making bad decisions in order to complete the plan. So you may be at home and you've got a sore throat and you're a bit suspicious of your health, but you know that if you don't turn up, the event's not gonna happen. And then you feel terrible and you just think, oh, it's not really bad. It's, and this is when people make bad decisions and it's a known thing, the point of failure. So the easier you make it for people to drop out and make the right decision, the less likely it is to go wrong. I probably need to whisk on. I have no idea of timing. So marketing wise, I would say definitely do tickets in advance. Um, having certain having a certainty about the maximum number of people who will show up is enormously useful for all of your planning. Um, also, it means that you have less face to face contact when they arrive. I would just minimize all of that. You don't want to be exchanging cash. You don't want to be getting up close and personal to every single person as they arrive. Imagine the person on the front desk who's leaning into each visitor. I mean, this is my thought about the temperature probe, that the person taking the temperature, you probably want a N95 mask on them because they're getting fairly close to every single person who's coming up. And there's a lot more asymptomatic people than there will be people who have active fevers. Um, you might want to limit who comes to make it easier. Kids under three years don't wear masks. Um, also, obviously, behaviour-wise, harder to control. If you mandate the use of masks, it means that you're excluding some people with various disabilities. Is it necessary if it's an outdoor event? You know, is the mask really the only thing between you and a dangerous event, which is a scary thought? Um, if you do allow people to come and without a mask if they have purpose to do that. You may wish to provide lanyards or encourage them to wear lanyards to show that they have a reason not to wear a mask so they're not being constantly asked. Um, you can also limit the risks by keeping it local. If you have people coming from across the region to your event, for a start, you're mixing people from a lot of different communities also, they're more likely to need the toilet, they're more likely to spend longer at the event, but having small local events where people are spending less time is going to be a lot safer. And generally, reducing the time people spend on site is good. So having a small busy, a small event where you do lots in a short amount of time, but then leave is better. So one thing you might consider is doing timed sessions to avoid everyone arriving at the same time and having to queue up outside or all trying to get through the gate at the same time. You could have staggered starts, staggered ends, have, so you've just got a constant flow of people coming through, but no one is spending so long on site that you're overloading your site. You can get a lot of people through, but without having the big masses of people all moving the same way at the same time. Um, I feel I'm going to go way over time, so I'm just going to whiz through things. Um, the other thing about online ticketing is that you can communicate very easily to them. You can send them emails in advance, communicating your expectations of behaviour and mask wearing, things like that. And also, if you do need to cancel due to staff illness or because of a sudden surge of infections in the area, then you can very easily contact everybody to cancel as well. So arrival times, um, you're outside. Where is the point at which you close your event if it's cancelled? Where is the sign that says we are closed? Where's the sign that says no more entry for whatever reason? 
how do you stop people queuing at this point? Um, parking, if you charge for parking, are you then encouraging household mixing? Do you have enough car spaces for everyone to come as a separate household and more spread out? Um, can you minimize contact on arrival? Can you just, to be honest, I would get them to get tickets and then I wouldn't even bother checking them because you always get fewer people turning up than have tickets. And if a few slip in, it really doesn't matter. And just, just let them come in and then you don't have to get that close to them at all. There's no faffing around. We've been talking about rules and risk assessments. Um, getting people to follow rules is interesting. So some people don't. If you have little kids there, obviously they will be small children. They are small children. If you have alcohol there, then you may find that people are more likely to misbehave. If people don't follow the rules, what do you do? And it's worth kind of thinking like, if, I'm, if I see someone without a mask harassing someone, who do I tell? Who's gonna come and actually try to deal with that? Um, in terms of compliance for wearing masks and things, I would say the best way to make them compliant is to just make it easy for them. Give them free masks if they don't have one. Give them free tissues if they don't have them. Give them free lanyards um, to denote they don't need to wear a mask if they don't have them. Just make it as easy as possible for them to be compliant. And in terms of Ooh, where was I going? I just wouldn't allow alcohol at all because it's a lot easier. Um, and also, just again, I spoke about making it easy for people not to turn up if they feel unwell. Also, if a member felt unsafe during the event, they're out there doing a role, a job, and they suddenly feel this is not safe for me, how would they leave without causing trouble to the event? How would, who would they tell? How would they organise their departure? just making sure that people do are empowered to do that. And also what happens if a member doesn't follow the rules, you're gonna kick them out. Because some people just don't think this stuff matters. They really don't. And they'll do the paperwork and then completely ignore it because they're just a maverick. And how do you deal with that? Um, I'm trying to look at time, it's probably way over. So- Eight minutes, Jenny. Hang on, can you say that again? About another seven or eight minutes, including. Am I, uh, am I, am I over time or is that how much I got left? Uh, you've got about another seven or eight minutes, including. Oh, that's pay. ages. Yes. Oh, that's, that's fine. Um, so, so, how do people move? So, people arrive on site, they go through the entry, and the first thing they do is stop and have a look around. So, if you have a load of people all arriving at once, they'll go through the entry and then they'll stop. And then you get a massive crowd of them just at that point, which completely blocks the way for everyone behind them. So it's just thinking about how people move. Do you need a marshal at this point to keep them going? Or do you need something further ahead, which will give them an obvious place to do this so that they don't do it in the pinch point? Um, people don't walk single file, so you can measure out two meters, but they'll have someone walking next to them most of the time. So you might need a bit more space than you think. Um, I think we've already spoken about having one-way systems and trying to separate them and just thinking about how humans move. So if you're outside and it's dark, if there's a pool of light somewhere, you might end up with a crowd of people over there trying to do something. And so it may be worth having people whose job it is just to walk around and spot if you've got clots of people or if there are pinch points and can do a bit of crowd management if necessary. So it's hard to predict in advance the first time you run an event. Um, queues, I would agree with previous speaker that try to avoid queuing at all costs. Um, why would people be queuing? What are they queuing for? Are they queuing for the toilets? Are they queuing to check their ticket? Are they queuing to have a look through a telescope? The queues will be really long because people are so separated out. How are you going to mark it on the floor if you're outside, it's dark and you don't want to put trip hazards everywhere. Um, so think in advance where queues will go. Make sure there is a place for them which doesn't create further pinch points. And again, you might need a marshal, like if you have a toilet, just to make sure the queue doesn't get out of hand. And movable and adaptable signage is really useful as well. 
just have some spare signs somewhere that you can pull out if you need them. And pictures are much better than text because not everyone can read, but also just pictures are much quicker to understand. People, no one will read a paragraph of text on a sign. Um, you can avoid queuing also by just and masses of people just by avoiding timed events. If you have lots of little things happening all over the place, then it's going to be a lot easier. You're not going to get mass movements, which cause the problems. And also lots of little things. What you don't want to do is be like shouting at everyone going, hey, the talk's about to start and like spraying them with virus as you do so as well. So using PA is good. Generally keeping background noise low as well so that if someone's hard of hearing, um, it's not going to be such a problem because with the mask on as well, that could be a, another problem. Ooh, I talked about movement. So what facilities are you providing? Like toilets, uh, obviously you've got to do a load of cleaning and management of that. How long is your event? How far have people traveled to come to it? How old are they? Some people may need the toilet. Some people may not be able to attend your event if there's no toilet. Some people may go and wee in the bushes if there's no toilet. So just thinking about how that affects things. Um, do you have seats that people can sit on? Not everyone can stand up very long. It's good to have seats. It's good to clean them if you do have seats. And what and bins as well, just have no touch bins. Make sure whoever's cleaning the bin out at the end of the evening has proper PPE, because if they're going to be dealing with dropped used tissues, they need to be properly gloved up and masked up. And think about first aid, because even if you don't have an official first aider and you're not officially offering first aid, if someone breaks their leg, in reality, what's going to happen? Someone's going to go and get one of your marshals and you're going to be involved whether you like it or not. So even if you can't actually administer first aid, you're still going to be somehow managing that situation. Or if someone started coughing really badly and they really look very covid then where would you put them? And how would you then manage identifying everyone they've been close to so that you could arrange for them to be into isolation afterwards? Um, provision of hand sanitizer, all of that we've spoken about, making sure your team have everything they need. And if you have an outdoor event, but with a small inside area, which your team is using, then you need to sanitize that indoor area as well as you would if the public were using it as well. And obviously make sure your team aren't all going into the tea room together and breathing on each other. It needs to be managed just as well as the outdoor areas. Um, yeah, so that's a really quick whiz through. What I'm trying to do is just really kind of shine a light on a load of the things that need to be thought about. And I'd completely agree with Ian that things are manageable often. You just need to think it through. So although it sounds really complicated, a lot of it is just the thought of being sensible and thinking it through. Although also you, I would also say that one of the jobs of risk assessment is to create a situation in which it is possible that you decide the event cannot go ahead as planned. And that's going to be changing all the time, depending on what the virus does and what we learn about it and the way it's transmitted. And so there's no definite decisions about anything, but you do need to be thinking about this stuff at the point you're ready to make that decision. Whew, and I think that's everything. And I didn't talk about like telescopes and stuff because Julia is going to talk about the actual activities which may be run at this type of event. So that's it from me. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I think we've got time for a, a, a question or two. Martin? We seem to have lost Martin. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Steve Tonkin saying, can you simply say this event is not suitable for people who cannot wear a mask? Yes, yeah, so my don't take this as like legal advice because I am not 100%, but from what I understand at this time, I think, yes, you can mandate the use of masks. Um, but again, my thought is if really, if that's the only thing standing between an outdoor event being safe and not, then, you know, are you really that close to the line? You can't have someone who's not wearing a mask because they're unable to and they just keep a bit more distant. But you can, you can do it, I yes, think, I believe. 
John Axtell makes the point that Peter um, looks like he's nodding a little bit, maybe. Yes. <laughs> So somebody, some John Axel makes the point here that somebody could be asymptomatic and uh, and a spreader. So the last thing you want is somebody there with a mask. Um, I, I, I think I'd err on the side of caution and say um, no admission for people who can't wear a mask, which I know seems unfair, but... Uh, uh, it depends on the situation because the situation is changing all the time. So at this time, I wouldn't even run an event with masks. But um, there may be a point at which many people are vaccinated, the risk is very low, at which that's acceptable. But um, yeah. there's one person, isn't it? So the risk is low that it's unlikely they personally are uh, infected. So it's one person with more risk rather than 100 people with a little bit less risk. So you've got to balance it all out. Yes. OK, um, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, Perhaps we can move on now to uh, to Julia Gardelli, who um, is a I know from uh, from some years past Guildford Astronomical Society, where uh, Julia has been responsible for organising uh, outreach uh, for a number of years. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. Just sharing my screen. Okay, can you see that please, Paul? Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to discuss ways of getting back into doing outreach in the case where the audience is outside and the location isn't your society's own premises. So I'll say a little bit about planning the event. Um, a lot of it's been said already, so we can skip through that quite quickly. Um, but I'll also look at some practical ways of getting back into outreach and doing it in a safe way. So these are typically the organisations for which societies provide outreach. So for our own society, the uniformed group makes up by far the largest sector in terms of number of events. That's the beavers, rainbows, brownies, scouts, guides, etc. Um, these uniformed groups might invite you to their own headquarters or the venue for outreach might be at a local playing field or a park or their campsite. Um, in terms of schools and colleges, they will almost certainly host outreach on their own premises. And working with the uniform groups in the schools has a couple of advantages. The first is that you're dealing with a finite number of people, so you know really who the audience is, what the group size is, and the behaviours of the people are, are, are e more easily controlled by the host. And secondly, they will already have plans in place for a return to normal activities during and beyond COVID. So for universities and some of the other uh, local interest groups, a few examples are put there. Outreach may or may not take place at their own venue and the audience might not be quite so clearly defined. And as Jenny mentioned, uh, numbers can be controlled in these cases by using an online ticketing system. And then finally, there are events such as collaborative events like uh, World Space Week. Um, that was held entirely online last year. And this October, the current plan is to hold all the activities at one location, such as a university. But in the past, um, something like World Space Week, we've gone to with um, telescopes set up up and down um, the high street, for example, and uh, any number of people wandering past to have a look through the eyepiece. So that's probably not going to happen until well into the future. Um, for all of these events, there's a shared control of risk and mitigation, and it's necessary to work really closely with the organisers in the planning stages, as we've already heard. So many of the considerations for the indoor events also apply, but possibly the risk is slightly lower through being outdoors. On the other hand, traffic flow is more difficult, particularly with groups of young people. So if you're at the host's own venue, then the usual checks on the insurance cover and doing risk assessments apply, uh, including the additional risk assessments associated with COVID. And these have already been covered in the previous talks. And uh, as Jenny mentioned, on public land, the host must also check local authority restrictions and on private land, it, additionally, you should have permission from whoever owns the land to go ahead. It's important to um, make some thorough plans before the event, and this could include maybe meeting up with a host organiser at the proposed location uh, before the event and establishing 
um, a lot of the things that Jenny talked about. Is there enough space for the size of the group? If the space is large, then where are the boundaries? An example that springs to mind for me is um, doing outreach for a, a, a pack of uh, Cub Scouts, say, on the local recreation ground. Can you use a tennis court, a ball court, or, or some hard standing with an edge so that, that you kind of have your own separate area? Um, the image there is um, an event we ran for the International Year of Astronomy 2009, where we used the university's um, sports um, facilities to um, run an event where we didn't know how many people were turning up, but we didn't want people milling around. And that's the sort of thing that would work really well. Um, the young people should be briefed about what's expected of them and what's going to happen on the night, including where they, they can go and shouldn't go. And then um, also need to consider, uh, will there be other people using the same location? And it, what's the plan if you deal with members of public who are not socially distancing? Are there sufficient marshals to deal with the number of people you're expected? Um, are there clear signs? Um, what are the plans for moving people to and from the observing site? And um, for your society, what are the arrangements for car parking and drop-off points? And is there enough space to set up safely? Um, do the host provide hand sanitizers for everyone? And is the use of face masks mandatory? We've already discussed. If equipment is being used by the outreach providers, then each individual is responsible for cleaning their own equipment. And we've heard about suitable methods already. Uh, your society could appoint someone at the event to oversee special arrangements for COVID. Um, and all the arrangements that you must that you make should supplement and not replace any plans that are already in place, that have been put in place by the host organizers. So this is what outreach means for a lot of us. So top left, we have a lot of uh, young people uh, doing solar observing. They formed some sort of orderly queue. And there are some supervisors with them who may or may not be supervising closely. Um, you're all familiar with the image top right. That is an entire scout pack. Um, one of the Cub Scouts is interested in astronomy. The other 29 are off playing football in the dark somewhere. Um, bottom right is a sort of um, event that we would hold, say, with a national trust, where we set up telescopes in a very large open area and have the public milling around. And the image uh, on the left makes me feel truly uncomfortable, even without any COVID restrictions. So in terms of practical activities, there are already lots of suggestions within, for example, the badge requirements for scouts or guides. And here are just a few examples. None of these need to involve getting close to other people or looking through a telescope. And most of all of them can be done outside. Now the badges are fairly flexible, so you can use and adapt uh, suggestions like these for different children, different age groups. And the ones that aren't on the badge requirements are making impact craters and simulating a Mars lander by packaging and dropping a raw egg from a height. Um, so um, they're absolutely great fun, um, but they could come under part of the badge where you um, have to investigate a space mission and get some information about it. Um, what else have we got here? We've got, um, so things you could do outdoors um, with at a distance, um, pointing to the sky to find the pole star, how to find it, uh, looking at the moon and pointing out the various features. Um, if the ISS or other satellites are crossing your sky, then that's great as well. Um, I've made and fired many model rockets and that is enormous fun. And um, the model spacecraft and recycled materials, I think, is um, it's just about on all the badge, badge work um, requirements. Um, so the model of the solar system using fruits or sports balls, that actually works with uh, using the youngsters themselves. So you have one um, young person who's the sun, and then you get everyone to distance themselves to form the solar system to scale. Um, it's great fun getting a volunteer to um, be Proxima Centauri and then sending them off to Moscow. Um, and finally, uh, reading a star map using a compass and a red light. So that gets them into uh, looking at the sky and using the red light to find their way around and using a map to look at the sky.
So some of the things you might do as a group, um, an astronomy group for um, a group of uh, young people, or in fact, an audience of adults as well. Uh, one idea is to provide a printed star map, one for each visitor and uh, information about what to look for in the sky. This obviously needs uh, planning beforehand, um, but you give out the star map um, everyone has brought their own red torch, hopefully, and they simply um, tour themselves around the night sky. This can also be done uh, presenter-led, and as mentioned, the presenter needs to um, be at a suitable distance, um, wearing a visor rather than a mask, and if they can't speak loudly enough to reach everyone, then think about using the PA system. Um, could also maybe consider a bring your own binoculars night, um, uh, so along the lines of the uh, things I've just mentioned, we use binoculars to find your way around the night sky where the astronomers point out items of interest. Um, mobile phones, you can get, as you know, um, applications that you can download that will show you um, the entire sky. You hold up the phone and you can see what's in the sky. So you can get members of the public to um, load them onto their phones and then bring them along to a location and you can talk through uh, what to look at. Um, a suggestion that I've had that is really said to work very well is to clamp a mobile phone to the eyepiece of a telescope and then take photos or show a live image. And this might also work if you want individuals to put their phone into the clamp, um, cleaning the clamp in between each use. Just to note that if you want to do this activity for um, scouts, guides or school children, that you'll need to tell them beforehand to bring their phones with them because they're not normally allowed to bring mobile phones to scout uh, meetings. And uh, another suggestion is to uh, go online and find out what's crossing the sky in terms of satellites. You could spend a whole evening talking about satellites and space debris and all the bits and pieces that are up there and then watching for it across the sky in real time. And if you can get power outside uh, to where you are, then um, you could set up a large screen and then use either webcam or CCD or a stellar cam or similar to output uh, images from a telescope onto a screen. So our society has a stellar cam and we've used this many times. It works really well on the moon and planets. And we've managed to image deep sky objects, the brighter ones admittedly, um, onto a big screen. And then people can stand uh, a distance away and look at the output. And um, talking about live images, um, it's also possible to connect to remote telescopes. So the image at the top right is my colleague, Colin, who is showing live images from his telescope in Spain onto a tablet, but that could also go onto a large screen so people could view that from a distance. Um, you could show the planetarium software such as Solarium and so on up to a big screen and have people uh, in the audience uh, choose where they want to go and zoom in on the various objects. And finally, solar observing should be possible um, if you have the appropriate safety things in place for the solar observing. Um, so, for example, if you're using approved safety glasses, then you can provide one, one pair per person to avoid sharing them. And solar observing via projection works well as well. So uh, there's an example there of a sunspotter and a solar scope, both of which were used at an event um, at the end of 2019 very successfully. By the way, making a sun spotter and solar scope is a, a really good uh, COVID-19 lockdown project for anyone who's interested. So I hope that's given you a few suggestions. Thanks very much for listening and any questions. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, so, uh, Martin, have you got some questions to ask, Julia? Uh, has anyone used the Stella? Uh, what's it called? A Stellina system. I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't know what a Stellina system is. I guess it's some kind of uh, webcam from Michael Brightwell. I'm not familiar with it, sorry. No. Um, no, that is all on that section. We do have lots of other questions. Okay. 
I could just quickly say that there's a note from Claire and Ian Lorries saying that they believe the Disability Discrimination Act would apply in terms of excluding people who can't wear masks. So you should definitely, definitely double check it because I may well have been wrong. Okay, thank you. There was a, a question that um, you wanted to reply to uh, uh, in person, Charles. One was from uh, Brian Dodson. Would it be a good idea to do risk assessment and pass it to the organisers to sign in acceptance? I may not be the right person to, to answer this, but obviously I, I see both sides of the, the coin. And I did sort of mention the thing. I think it's very important that the host venue does their own risk assessment. They know the venue, they know the people who are there, uh, they know everything that's going on there. Um, and, but you should then work with that and adapt it to what you then plan to do with it. And I, I think it's very important that it needs to be that, that way around, but do correct me Ian or anybody else if I'm. No, I would, uh, I would endorse what you're saying, uh, Charles, and I would say that to anybody, if you are using a host um, venue or anything like that, you know, be prepared to ask for the risk assessment. Um, you know, it, they do have that requirement to, to provide that for you. And again, if you're not happy with the results of that risk assessment, if you're not, if you don't feel that that particular venue is suitable or safe for any reason, don't be afraid to walk away from it because what could happen is, you know, you then take on some of the responsibility. And the problem would be if that you're the person who's organising the event, um, you know, the people will see you as a responsible person. Well, in reality, it's something that has been caused by the venue. So I would say, yes, you know, certainly get that risk assessment and don't just accept that risk assessment. Have a good look at it and see whether you think it does, you know, meet the requirements. If there's anything you're not happy with it, then go back to the host and try say asking, so. Try asking a question like, what would you do if, or what's the plan? Yeah. And also see if they've got a first aid kit. I mean, some of those very basic things that actually, and if they haven't mm. got all those things, well, yeah, I don't think you then, Get in your car and say, sorry, I'm not doing it. But, uh, you know, it needs to be somewhere recorded that you have made the effort to do that. Yeah, I, yeah one definitely. The, yeah. One of the comments that I saw on the Q&A was about having first aiders on site. And whilst I don't think it's a legal requirement, I certainly think it's good practice mm. to have people around who are competent in first aid. And I think it's a good point that Jenny made as well. The fact is that we're all public spirited and we might not be an official first aider, but what would you do if somebody collapsed in front of you or somebody broke a leg? We would lend a hand, you know, you would you would do that. So in effect, if you're, you know, if you've got a yellow jacket on, you're a marshal, you're an organiser, you're going to be a first aider potentially. Yes. Like, you're, not, you're not going to walk away and refuse to do it, you know. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of organisations around that will give non um, statutory organisations such as Astro Societies mm. preferential rates at uh, first aid courses and things like that. It's not difficult to get the, the only thing I would say, and it's a bit obscure, people have often asked in the past, you know, what if I was a first aid or what if I did something? Say, for example, somebody did break a leg or something like that. And let's say, you moved that person or you did something wrong and subsequently that person goes for hospital treatment and they were given the information well if the person hadn't have done that at the scene you know the break wouldn't have been as bad or something like that um, and it probably for that reason it, it, it it's probably good practice not a legal requirement but a good idea for somebody in the society to maybe have some rudimentary knowledge of first aid, some basic certificate, then at least you've got that person. And if you were ever challenged, you could say, well, so-and-so has got a basic first aid certificate. I mean, the things that you can do relatively low cost and things like that. So it's, I mean, I'm kind of think, I'm thinking on my feet now kind of thing. So, uh, you know, like I say, a lot of this is just kind of trying to think things through from a common sense, from a logical point of view, really. So, you know. I know I, when I did first aid training, they specifically said about this, fear that people have that they'll try mm. to help and make it worse and they said in reality no one ever gets done for that and if someone tries mm. to see you for it the court will just say well they were doing their best mm. and trying mm. to help yeah. so yeah. yeah it's not yeah. a real risk but i reckon just get yeah do a first aid course it's really interesting it's a good mm. thing to do why yeah definitely I, I think generally speaking there is a good samaritan approach to these things mm. whilst mm. i think it's terrific if people do get first aid training I think if you're, you feel you're the best person available at that time, I don't think any court will, um, unless, you, unless you've done something absolutely horrific, I don't think any court will uh, hold it against you that you tried to uh, assist the person. 
So there was a, a question that, in fact, uh, Jenny uh, here had uh, of asking if you could say something about the relative protection afforded by masks versus visors. Well, I think I think I think they both have their place, and I think masks are probably more efficient at mouth and nose. But you obviously, with the visor, you get you get protection from eye eye problems. Um, and it may be that people who can't wear masks for some reasons could be encouraged to wear a, a visor instead, because that it may not be quite as good. Because obviously the atmosphere is still you may get droplets floating in the air and then come underneath the visor, but it'd be a be lot better than nothing. So that may be one of the answers to people who say I can't I can't wear a, a mask because after all, some of the people who wear masks wear it because they may be vulnerable themselves and they have chest trouble trouble breathing. So they're vulnerable and you are looking after their health as much as everybody else is by saying, well, look, if you can't wear a mask, perhaps you could wear a visor and that, that would make it easy because we don't, we don't want you to get infected by somebody else here who is asymptomatic and doesn't realize they're carrying COVID. Yeah, so, that was one of the comments made by Charles early on, of course, is that visors do have the advantage that particularly for a speaker or a presenter, that someone who has a uh, uh, hearing difficulty may be able to lip read with a visor, which they won't be able to do with a mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, while we're on um, first aiders and employees and what have you, there's a couple. Um, are there any special rules, e.g. use of PPE for first aiders? And on an insurance sort of spin, um, are society volunteers deemed to be employees in terms of insurance? <laughs> okay, um, Ian? Yeah, well, um, certainly um, pre-COVID, certainly um, as regards sort of, uh, you know, first aid or something like that, it's been sort of good practice for a while. And in fact, if you're in a workplace of either requirement, but things like disposable gloves, obviously, if you're dealing with anything, you know, with any contact with blood, body fluids, anything like that. And for a long time, I know going back... Um, Paul did mention, you know, I'd had a career in the Metropolitan Police, I know years and years ago we carried sort of, um, you know, kind of like face shields for if you had to do um, artificial respiration and that kind of thing. So, you know, it's good sense for, for first aiders to protect themselves anyway. Now, obviously, post-Covid, you know, things have obviously been announced a lot more than that and maybe uh, Peter can maybe give uh, more more specific background to that. Well, I think, I, I think one of the things has come one of the pieces of advice for first aiders at say heart attacks, cardiac arrests, is not to do mouth to mouth resuscitation. It's a bit harsh, but I think the risks where some areas, um, it, the number of people who have COVID at any one time is getting higher and higher. The recommendations are coming out to say, do not do for mouth to mouth resuscitation. We don't do as much resuscitation um, we don't do so, so much ventilation as we used to. Most of it is around uh, heart massage rather than um, breaths. But there were usually we give what they call recovery breaths every now and again. But now they're saying, actually, for your own protection, unless you have protective gear with you, probably don't do mouth to mouth resuscitation. And then maybe on the other point about um, volunteers and employees, I mean, that's kind of always been a, a tricky one for a while. Um, I mean, certainly if it was, say, a society event or something like that, I mean, clearly, obviously, it wouldn't be a workplace, and um, then it's unlikely that volunteers in that situation would be legally classed as employees. But from a risk management point of view, it's always a good idea to apply the principle that you would still treat them as though they were employees, so, you know, still have health and safety rules in place and that kind of thing, which would mirror it. Now, where the sort of waters might get a little bit muddied, you might have certain organisations like, um, and other certain people, apologies, I can't remember which of the speakers that maybe run sort of professional observatories and that kind of thing, which are actually a workplace, that then it may well be that they actually do ask for volunteers as well. Things like museums, for example, things like that, where there are, you know, volunteer guides and those kind of things. Now, 
Um, in that particular case, volunteers could be classed as employees, even though they're not actually taking a salary, they're still sort of subject to the same rules and the same requirements and the same precautions and should be treated as though they were employees. So that's Certainly at the uh, planetarium where I work, we mm. look at all volunteers uh, as though they were employees in terms yeah. of health and safety and um, uh, legal duty of care and so on. So that's... And, 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 yeah, yeah, and that's definitely the way that I would suggest that you kind of manage it kind of thing, you know. I mean, it's really not a case of saying what legislation applies. I would sort of think, you know, uh, the chances of anybody being prosecuted or anything like that are, are, are quite remote, if I'm quite frank about it. It very rarely happens in workplaces. But it's the principles that we need to apply, you know, and the actual sort of protocols and thinking about it, as Graham's just said, you know, treat people as they are, even though they legally may not be you know, apply the same kind of rules. Why would you discriminate just because somebody's a volunteer or somebody's an employee? Yep. Um, so, you know, that's the best advice. I wouldn't get too hung up on the specific legal requirements. Um, take everything back to the principles that I discussed and, and really everybody's discussed, you know, they've just endorsed what's really good common sense risk assessment. That's probably been the underlying theme, certainly throughout the second half of the presentations today. So... We've got a question here. Thank you, Ian. We've got a question here from um, John Wood, maybe to, to aim to uh, Lucinda. Um, someone's saying that as an alternative to uh, lip reading, it's possible to have captioning software like Otter, etc., to manage your live captioning on your Zoom sessions. Do you have any experience of that, Lucinda? Uh, no, I, I typed an answer to a, a similar question earlier. Um, that we haven't used um, captioning yet. Uh, the technology that YouTube uses isn't always perfect, so we'd have to go back in there and make edits, which can be time consuming, uh, you know, with all that. Um, but if you're interested or open to using it, and the Otter sounds great, I, I'm just, I just need to experiment it with more, but it's definitely something that we need to start doing more of to make what we are doing online accessible to all. So that's definitely something we're gonna be looking into for 2021. Okay. I've been in international conferences where they've used it and it works. It's quite eccentric sometimes, but it works surprisingly well. You know, it works as well as you might expect. It's not brilliant, but it's really useful. And especially for people whose hearing isn't so good or have English as a second language, it can be a help. But it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Yes, that's, that's uh, Otter, O-T-T-E-R, that's the software. Do, do you know whether it's um, free? Does, any, does anyone know whether it's free or whether you have to pay for it? Well, I know it's built into YouTube, so YouTube could do it too. And I was talking mostly about the YouTube technology. Um, I don't know about Otter, um, but again, I would just try it out and see if it works, how well it works. And, and it with astronomical words. Sorry, Charlie, go ahead. Can it cope with astronomical words, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Right. Martin? Um, John was making a point um, that uh, we have to mark up social distancing um, and seems to suggest that you think that the level of COVID risk and the likelihood of it being transferred during an event isn't high enough to cause any outreach event to be abandoned. Um, or, di or did he get that wrong? That was, I think he just wants clarification on distancing. I well, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but uh, uh, I would say that you have to kind of take the situation as it is now um, and look at um, the kind of conditions we're we're operating in. I think you would always put in a social distancing um, element. Uh, I think one of the comments I saw was, "How can we do that in the dark?" Um, and one of the, my response on online was that well maybe you have some of your members as marshals uh, who've got a very good manner and uh, just kind of gently encouraging people to stay socially distanced i think members uh, in the organizing committee you've got to know the site and you're going to know where the telescopes are much much better than the members of the public so they're going to be less familiar with it so this is where good marshalling i think comes to its own I think, you should just give yeah. I think you should just give everyone like a two metre long balloon and they're allowed <laughs> to whack other people with it if they get yeah. too close. 
Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say, probably going forward, I know um, uh, Peter mentioned earlier, you, you know, what's going to be the new norm. And, um, you know, at the moment, we don't have a great deal of choice. We can't hold any events or anything like that. But previously, you know, like last summer and things like that, we were using things like uh, distance markers and things like that. And maybe that's just something that we are going forward, we're going to have to get used to. You know, there's going to be a whole new world at the end of this. And, I could say, you know, um, it's probably like I tried to point out in my presentation, you know, it's not necessarily a reason to be risk averse and cancel everything when hopefully we do get back to some semblance of normality. And eventually, you know, we're going to have to do um, both at work and both for, for, for leisure time. And maybe things like masks, eye protection and social distancing is going to be something that is going to be the new normality. So maybe something that we need to think of as, as good habits. Somebody said the other day, will we ever go back to blowing candles out on birthday cakes? <laughs> I mean, and, and I think, I think from my a, point of view... It's not a reason to cancel birthdays, though. <laughs> you know, from, from, from my point of view, a lot of the things that we're doing now for COVID protect... I mean, you only need to think hand washing, sanitizer, and things like that. Should we not have been doing that anyway? Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, Peter can tell us about common colds and other kind of common illnesses. Surely we'd been using good sanitation and, uh, yeah. you know, a lot of workplaces in the past have had sanitizers in the, uh, you know, refreshment areas and by the door handles and outside the toilets and things like that. So, you know, a lot of it is good practice, really. You know, you apply good hygiene principles and you'll go a long way to, you know, putting in place the COVID precautions. Yeah. So, Presumably the number of infections from other diseases um, have, are lower than, than they were in the past because we've all been following distancing and using hand sanitizer. Yes, I mean, the number of colds and flu that's been around uh, has decreased, as, as indeed has have sexually transmitted diseases. <laughs> so every cloud's got a silver lining, I suppose. <laughs> Fairly obvious reasons. <laughs> Um, right, there's 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 one here from one here from Steve. Personal behaviour, it, it might even come under discrimination. Would you allow someone to attend who is fit but clinically vulnerable? I wonder how you might know that they are fit or clinically vulnerable. I mean, yeah. not the sort of information you request of people when they join uh, an event. So I think it's down to their own, the individual's own desire and risk really it's um I interject. yes as somebody who is extremely clinically vulnerable has been shielding for a year trust me we will only come out if we feel safe yes. we're not going anywhere um, yeah yeah absolutely okay Any... um, it's isopropyl alcohol good for eyepieces Isopropyl alcohol is the um, is the alcohol uh, that uh, you can use. It's it depends how it's um, formulated. Sometimes it's a gel, in which case it will be sticking into nooks and crannies. Or sometimes you can get it as more of a liquid, uh, which will then evaporate off much more easily. So um, I think that's that's my comment to it. Really, it depends on the type of preparation. What's it called? Beta eye please fluid. I think that's isopropyl up. Beta. Yes, has to be seventy percent to be effective. Yes, yeah. Um, while you're there, Graham, do you happen to know the rough cost of your hundred and fifty cubic meter per hour air circulator? It was about twelve hundred pounds. Bargain, I'm sure. Well, um, I think as the, some of the comments have been made, you know, it's it's good to go forward. Uh, you know, even without the COVID, it's a good idea to have lots of fresh air uh, mm -hmm. in that building because the buildings can get quite stuffy. You're on top of a hill. You tend to lock the windows down to keep warm and it gets stuffy. So I think this is a that was a good investment anyway. Uh, and I think some of the things that come out of this afternoon is that the, the, to take forward even after COVID has kind of stopped being a pandemic, there might be some very useful aspects, you know, such as the online and the, the preparations that we've made around observatories and hand washing, et cetera, et cetera. I think we'll fall out of this. So there could be some good things to take to the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there was a, a question which said exactly that. And I, and I think that 
my experience in the last few weeks uh, of doing tours around my observatory, which obviously I would do in person normally, but doing them over Zoom, or despite my sort of rather amateur sort of wandering around with my uh, uh, with my camera on the, on the laptop, um, has enormously increased uh, access. So the sort of people who can come to the observatory, uh, elderly, young, etc., and get an experience by looking at you in the in the warm, etc., as I mentioned before, has been there. I would suggest that even after all this, I mean, let's hope it does sort of pass in general. Um, using online facilities in tandem with uh, other forms is something we should really consider getting up and running with. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I've got a comment here from uh, John Craythorn. Thank you, John, who's obviously looked up that Otter appears to be $8.33 per month, but there is a free trial version. So uh, that's, that's the cost of Otter. Okay. Um, any other burning questions? I think um, I think we're we are overrun a little. So I I, I guess if there's anything urgent we need to do, I, um, we we should be able to compile all these questions, shouldn't we? That remain. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it has been commented that maybe we ought to arrange perhaps an FAS feedback page. We already have an FAS web page for societies to contribute their experiences. And I think it's been up there already for three or four months, isn't it, Martin? Yeah. The, uh, their experiences in, in um, coping with doing outreach um, whilst we have COVID. That, of course, was during the periods when uh, there, there was a, a bit of a lull in the numbers. Uh, not safe now, of course. But that page, we can continue to, to contribute to that. Yes. Um, but also maybe ha if there is a, a, a feedback page for responses to... Uh, some of the questions asked here. I think we can save the, the chat and the Q&A questions that haven't been asked. And maybe we can ask the, uh, the speakers if they can perhaps answer some of those questions for our uh, feedback web page as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I think uh, moving towards the close here, it remains for me to, to, to thank all of the speakers very much for all of the uh, excellent work you've done in bringing your presentations here to the to, to the community. Uh, we seem to have had a very good response as well from the number of people who came along. We started out with uh, uh, 150 people from 180 registrations that we had. Um, I think most people managed to get their links okay to join us. We're down to 115 now. Um, that may be because we've overrun, of course. Um, and uh, so Thank you very much for the speakers. Uh, and uh, something that I'm, I'm very um, impressed with is that this was a twinkle in the eye, really, following the FAS AGM back in September. But to be honest, we've only really started to, to plan this from the beginning of December. And so to have had eight speakers, so many people attending, all done within the space of about a month, if you include the few days around Christmas taken out, it just goes to show that online events like this are perfectly manageable by, by all of you. And um, so I, I, I hope you, could, you can take heart from that. Obviously, if you have any questions about the technicalities, then you can contact uh, myself or uh, maybe Martin directly and ask him questions. Um, so maybe I could ask here, do the same thing that, um, that Lucinda did earlier on, which is to ask for um, a couple of shows of hands here. The first question I have is, could I have a show of hands on people who found today's event useful? So far, okay, more well, it's going up, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is raising your hand at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so that's, that's pretty good. It's going up past the 80 mark, 80% 80 mark and climbing. So that was, that's, 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 that's very good. And then maybe I could um, ask one other question here, which is uh, to lower all the hands. Okay, the other question here is, um, did you generally find the, the format of the meeting useful?
Okay. And similarly, some, some good feedback there. Uh, people mostly found that uh, found it, it worked well for them. Uh, okay. Um, so one of the other things uh, that we're doing now that this is our first webinar and apologies for any technical glitches or slips we may have had, or maybe <laughs> things that Sorry. we said. <laughs> but um, the, um, we, we've got, um, the FAS is organizing a, a, another webinar for April the 9th. And this will be a, a sort of mini convention done online, if you like. So we're planning, we're very much in the early stages. We'll be planning to have uh, about four speakers, I think, and maybe one or two people um, advertising and showing what they sell and effectively a, a sort of an online version of the, um, the annual uh, convention that we do. Uh, but we are thinking about also looking forward to doing a, a fuller convention later in the year. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been, uh, been a very interesting experience and lots of useful information. And uh, we will, this recording will be uh, edited and uh, placed on the uh, FAS YouTube channel. You can just look up Federation of Astronomical Societies on YouTube to find the page. But once we've got that all set up, uh, and maybe also once we've got the uh, feedback page set up, we will send an email out to all the attendees to uh, let you all know that everything's uh, ready for you to, to, to look at. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.